cult, cult. The movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God. Unless you happen to be paying really close attention to global news back around 2000, particularly news from Central Africa, or happen to catch an episode about them on a podcast dedicated to cults in the past few years, it's very likely that you have not heard of them. Even though this cult murdered almost as many members than Jim Jones and the People's Temple cult. And many of them died in a much more brutal fashion. For those of us interested in doomsday cults, how and why they form, what they convince their followers to do, how they end, etc., the movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God is one hell of a wild ride. This was a big cult. Lots of members. Made a lot of money. Had a very bloody ending. And unlike Jim Jones, who died with his followers, the main leader of this cult and a few others might have gotten away with what they did. The movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God was led by Credonia Mwinde and Joseph Kabuteri in southeast, southwestern excuse me, Uganda, formed in the late 80s after both of its founders claimed that they had seen visions of the Virgin Mary compared notes, and started making some cult power moves. This cult originated during a particularly tumultuous time in Uganda, a nation that has seen almost nothing but tumultuous times. The country, which had been a protectorate of Great Britain from 1894 to 1961, has seen a whole lot of instability and chaos uh, that came with its uh, independence. The man who would eventually rise to rule Uganda after a years-long battle for leadership was a man named General Amin, a brutal dictator who forced out or killed many Ugandans and drove the economy into ruins. He's considered one of the most brutal despots in modern world history. Tens of thousands of Ugandans were baselessly arrested, murdered during Amin's reign of terror. Amin would be removed in 1979, leaving behind an economy in shambles, thousands dead, many more soon to be dead due to the devastating AIDS pandemic that turned into an AIDS epidemic. It was in this atmosphere that many, not just Credonia and Joseph, would begin to see visions of the Virgin Mary. People were desperately hoping for signs that God had not abandoned them, that relief from bloodshed and poverty would be coming. Due to colonization by Europeans, there had long been a Catholic presence in Uganda. All the economic turmoil, combined with a lot of local church scandals, caused many Ugandan Catholics to leave the church and form new Catholic splinter groups in the 80s. The movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God was one of several of these groups, and the one that would take their new ideas about God and God's plan to a more extreme place than any of their counterparts. They taught that in order to avoid damnation and the apocalypse, their followers had to follow the Ten Commandments. Sounds simple, right? Except their version of following was insanely distorted. Instead of interpreting thou shall not bear false witness witness, uh, as a ban on lying, they eventually took this as a ban on speech entirely, with many of the community's members keeping silent or speaking in sign language in order to avoid damning their souls to hell. Fasting was conducted regularly, And only one meal was eaten on Fridays and Mondays. Sex was forbidden, as was soap. Because, of course, the apocalypse was imminent, or so they said. And we all know that God hates uh, soap. It's a doomsday cult. Of course, their teachings were insane. Movement leaders declared that the apocalypse would occur on December 31st, 1999. Actually, that was their third prediction. First two hadn't obviously come true. And then this day also, of course, came and went without any of their baseless predictions coming true. And now members were really starting to get mad and wanting their money back. The leaders quickly refocused, set a new fourth doomsday date, March 17th, 2000. That morning when hundreds of movement members uh, inside a small rural church uh, were worshiping, celebrating, then an explosion was heard. Onlookers watched in terror as the church, with the windows boarded and the doors locked, blew up in a hellish fiery blast. And four days after this church exploded and then burned down, police investigated movement properties and discovered hundreds of dead bodies at other cult sites across southern Uganda. Some of them had been murdered up to three weeks before the inferno. And the leaders were nowhere to be found. Did they burn up in the explosion or the fire that followed? Or did they take the money and run? How did all this happen? Why did the movement take off in the first place? Why were so many people interested in its insane teachings? This is an off the beaten path cult story but one that's no less interesting than others that are much more well-known. If this had happened in the U.S., this cult would likely be just as infamous or maybe more infamous than the People's Temple or the the Jonetown Massacre or Heaven's Gate or David Koresh's cult in Waco, the Branch Davidians. The strange, sad, and ridiculous story of the movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God today on another cult, cult, cult edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. Listening to Time Suck. 
Happy Monday, meat sacks. Get your robes on. Pull down your hoods. Prepare to chant. Gather inside the suck dungeon. The cult of the curious is compound. Dan Cummins, the suck master, cult leader, censorship hater, George Carlin fanboy. And you are listening to Time Suck. Hail Nimrod. Hail Lucifina. Praiseable jangles. And could you cook up some cult sing-alongs for us, Triple M? Before I get going, uh, thanks so much to everyone who's already bought tickets to the uh, 2023 Burn It All Down Theater Tour. Uh, some markets have already sold out. I am blown away, overjoyed. It's very exciting. In the process of trying to add or have uh, already added by the time you hear this second shows in Boise, Seattle, and St. Louis. A uh, few other markets do not have many tickets left. Uh, thanks to everyone who also came out to the Nashville and Huntsville stand-up shows. Recording this right after get back, uh, getting back home from those club dates. So much fun. What a great way to start off this fall's tour. All tour dates, uh, you know, the the club dates this fall, Boston, Louisville, Austin, and more, and the theater dates for 2023 at dancummins.tv. Or, if you like horror more than stand-up, tickets on sale now for a new live Scared to Death show. Uh, Lindsay and I are doing that here soon, a new live virtual show through Moment, uh, Moment House as they were known last year when we used them in October, Scared to Death Live, Haunted Halloween, True Tales of Hallow's Eve Horror 2. Telling Halloween-themed horror tales that will only be told Thursday, October 27th, 6 p.m. Pacific time. There's going to be a live chat room to enjoy the show with others, uh, ask us questions. Uh, we got some uh, other things we're working on. Scared of this live Haunted Halloween, True Tales of Hallow's Eve Horror 2. Go to badmagicmerch.com for tickets. Uh, so fun last year. I think it's going to be more fun this year. And then last quick announcement. Killer new merch in the Bad Magic store this week with Halloween just around the corner. Uh, I think now would be a good time to get the spooky started. Start off spooky season in none other than uh, an Albert Frankenfish t-shirt. <laughs> what do you get when you send 100 amps through a dead Albert Fish? Show me his! Head on over to badmagicmerch.com and check it out. Uh, Logan killed it yet again on that design. And now, see, that wasn't, that wasn't so long. Now diving back into the realm of cults with another obscure one. At least to most in the Western world. Uh, which is a shame because this story so powerfully illustrates how deadly cults can be. In fact, in sheer numbers, the movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God would have a similar death count to the People's Temple, to the Jonestown Massacre, right? Where, uh, you know, 909 people died. Uh, the movement's leaders would kill nearly 800. Some sources list them as having killed uh, closer to 1,000 followers, more deadly than Jonestown. A few sources report 924 dead, but the most reliable sources uh, list the final death toll at 778, which is obviously still uh, very substantial. Hundreds of more people died than in the Waco siege. On the Branch Davidians compound down in Texas, uh, so many more died than during the Heaven's Gate group suicide where 39 cult members took their lives so they could try and board some sort of celestial spaceship traveling in a comet's tail. In terms of deadliness, the movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments is up there with the worst doomsday cults of modern history, if not all time. So why haven't they achieved the same kind of infamy? Researchers have a couple theories. Some think it's because this was uh, all pretty recent. Killings took place March 17th, 2000, less than 25 years ago. I guess they think this story just hasn't had enough time to marinate in the minds of the general public. Uh, that makes no sense to me, though. It's Heaven's Gate, uh, you know, Heaven's Gate, their final act went down only three years earlier, 1997. And the U.S. government siege on the Branch Davidian compound in Waco occurred only four years before that in 1993. More likely reason to me for the killings not getting widespread media coverage is the poor record keeping in a generally less than stable investigative atmosphere in Uganda at the time of the mass murders. The police were uh, ill-equipped to carry out investigations. We still don't know that much about them compared to so many other cults who have been objects of international study. Probably largely due to poor record keeping, there's no definitive book that's ever been written on the movement, not even known with certainty as we'll look into if their leaders are still alive or not. Also compared with all the other tragedy that has occurred in Uganda, in the surrounding areas uh, around Uganda, you know, around the same time for, for decades, actually, the deadly actions of this cult sadly just got lost in a lot of atrocity noise. Just before the movement really took off, Uganda's neighbor, uh, Rwanda, endured a massive genocide, just counting the Tutsi ethnic group, somewhere between 491,000 and 800,000 people died in just 100 days in the spring and summer of 1994. During that same 100 days, up to half a million girls and women estimated to have been raped. And the years before and since in that region have also been plagued by exceptionally high levels of violence, rape, illness, economic instability, and more. For example, in October 2002, not that long uh, after, you know, this uh, uh, massive, uh, you know, murder of all these cult members when the police would have been, you know, continuing to try and investigate the movement. 
The country was busy evacuating more than 400,000 civilians caught up in a fight against the cult-like Lord's Resistance Army Insurgency led by Joseph Kony. Pony to suck that dude one day for sure. According to the UN, Kony's LRA was responsible for more than 100,000 deaths, the abduction of between 60 and 100,000 kids, and the displacement of around 2.5 million civilians between 1987 and 2012. So in comparison to all that, between 750 and 1,000 people dying in a doomsday cult, sadly, didn't make a huge news splash. In this context, what's the importance of a small cult, at least to law enforcement? especially if they all seem to have been uh, uh, kind of you know, burnt out, not funded properly. Uh, another reason we might not hear, uh, I guess uh, I was going to say no pun intended on, on the burnt out uh, with law enforcement, maybe, maybe a little bit of pun intended. Another reason we might not hear about them as much uh, as uh, other cults is that the movement you know, continually insisted that it wasn't a cult. I think uh, with the local media before it uh, the, ended, it, it didn't get a lot of exposure as being a cult. It was just considered a sect of Roman Catholicism. You know, they claim they supported the authority of the Pope, worship Jesus as God's child, uh, you know, Mary's his mother. Uh, what's so wrong or culty about that? Well, as it would turn out, you know, so many things. And then finally, African cults and crimes in general just don't seem to draw as much attention uh, as, as other similar atrocities here in the West. And why is that? Could it be related to race? I wonder because white serial killers for sure get a lot more media play, you know, here than, than black serial killers. And here at Time Suck, you know, topics that are black centric, true crime, inspirational, whatever, consistently get fewer downloads than white centric topics. Uh, is that due to some form of racial bias? Do we just here in the West collectively care a lot less about cult members in Africa dying than we would about white cult members? Uh, and is that really racist or do people in general just prefer stories, regardless of their color, about people who look like them? maybe even subconsciously? Is there a lack of cultural understanding with some stories that make them harder to follow? Like when we talk about, say, a European subject, is it easier to understand the story here in the West because European culture more similar to American culture than, say, African culture is? More of us can then place ourselves in the story more easily. We can imagine, what if that was me? Is that harder to do with a culture that might seem much more foreign, you know, than some place in Europe to, or some other part of the U.S. that we live in or have a uh, uh, you know, have, have, you know, been to whatever the reason, even though today's cult is not as reported on as uh, some of the bigger cults we've covered, that doesn't mean that the movement, I'll generally shorten their lengthy name. Maybe, maybe they needed a better name to become more well-known. I will say uh, uh, Heaven's Gate better than their very long name. Uh, doesn't make him any less newsworthy. Percy, I love stories set outside the U.S. Stories set in a country and continent, you know, so culturally different than my own. I think that looking at other cultures actually gives us a great opportunity to reflect on our own. In today's case, to remind many of us how incredibly fucking lucky we are to have been born in or have been able to move to a place that is more or less pretty economically stable, not war-torn, safer, full of a lot more opportunities to live a peaceful and prosperous life than many other places. Today, we'll see how social instability, bad economic conditions, uh, viral illnesses that claim the lives of thousands you know, uh, uh, battles for leadership, how all this, you know, uh, a totalitarian leader who brutalizes his own people, how that can all contribute to an atmosphere in which charismatic leaders can take advantage of people, lead them to their uh, deaths in a land full of so much other chaos and death. Today, we'll discuss, we'll discuss more than the movement's final act. And don't worry, it won't all be dark and dreary. Some of their beliefs, uh, much of their teachings, unintentionally, uh, really fucking funny to me. So ridiculous. <laughs> A lot of interesting uh, visions. So can't wait to share uh, so much strange shit with you today. Let's get into it now. The Movement for the Restoration of the Ten Commandments of God, Another do Doomsday Cult. Uh, this one will be centered around the year 2000, you know, for their final act. Some call Y2K. Years leading up to Y2K were full of fear and paranoia all over the world. That for sure had to have helped recruitment. So first I'll talk about that. Uh, next, I'll show how colonialism created a lot of chaos in Uganda and elsewhere around Uganda. Chaos that led directly to a lot of fighting and governmental instability and oppression following Uganda's independence. I'll also look at how Catholic beliefs in Uganda were always changing thanks to having, uh, you know, been blended a bit with local spiritual beliefs in this syncretic way. This religion always uh, being in some state of flux or transition helps support a belief in offshoots, right? People are used to altering their beliefs. Catholicism in Uganda, much more mystical than here in the States, at least was at the time of this story. 
Reports of visions of Jesus or the mother Mary were common before the cult founded. People were used to believing that God spoke directly to certain Ugandans. That belief becoming pretty mainstream uh, for sure helped create a very fertile climate for the cult to grow in. I'll then illustrate what instability and turmoil Ugandans were dealing with in the decades leading up to the cult and its final act. How so much chaos and death and corruption might have made joining the doomsday cult seem almost uh, reasonable. You know, or at least seem like, well, fuck it, why not? Then we'll get an overview of the cult's founders and leading members, followed by diving into the cult's very strange beliefs, uh, followed by the timeline beginning with visions. <laughs> the cult's founders claim they had oh, some of these visions are so fucking darkly funny. Ending with the aftermath of the cult's destruction. Uh, the backdrop of gone in the late 90s really helped these cult leaders recruit a lot of members in so many ways. So let's start with looking at those Y2K beliefs now. Looking back on it today, it might surprise many of you how seriously a lot of people took uh, moving into a new millennium. I remember because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm getting older now. Uh, for many people, this is because of the so-called millennium bug and major computing systems. The millennium bug now goes back to the very beginning of computers. When complex computer programs were first written in the 1960s, engineers used a two-digit code for the year, leaving out the 1-9. So instead of writing like 1968, a computer would just know that information as uh, 68. Then a couple decades later, 1984, a woman named Marilyn J. Murray, who worked for an insurance company in Illinois, entered into her computer an annuity due date in the early 2000s. But instead of making the jump to 2000, her computer interpreted it as a year, uh, a century earlier. You know, 1904, say, uh, instead of 2004. And this meant that the numbers the computer churned out were complete nonsense. Marilyn and her husband then wrote a book titled Computers in Crisis. How to Avert the Coming Worldwide Computer Systems Collapse. Not many people noticed at that time. But by the end of the 1980s, people were getting worried. In the Social Security Administration, uh, they were beginning to find out that they too couldn't calculate figures for after 2000. That's a problem. And holy shit, it cracks me up that no one fucking anticipated that. I love that people smart enough to invent the very first computers and computer programs did not think about what would happen to those computers and their programs past the year 1999. So short-sighted, even the smart people. To me, that's like inventing a badass mobile phone, the first smartphone, but you forgot to build a way to recharge the battery. You know, oh, this is awesome, Melvin. Holy shit. A phone and a tiny computer in your hand, not connected to a wall. You can make calls and surf the web. You are a visionary, a wizard. Okay, so when this battery runs out, like how do we recharge it? I just, I don't see a port. It's, oh, oh, fuck. Oh, I knew I forgot something. 1994, Social Security started going through all of its millions of lines of relevant computer code, desperately trying to fix this problem. The Department of Defense <laughs> ran into similar difficulties, began a similar project. Don't want fucking missiles going off at the wrong time. A senior defense official said at one point, if we built houses the way we build software, the first woodpecker to come along would destroy civilization. That's a great quote. As the year 2000 approached, many believed that the systems would not interpret the 00 correctly, right? Causing a major glitch in the system. Like major glitch as sending humanity spiraling into a dystopian nightmare kind of glitch. Some believe that this would uh, cause a whole host of problems enough to literally collapse society as we know it. The most extreme warriors thought that banks would incorrectly calculate interest rates and way scarier account balances in general. You know, what if you have a (laughs) $200,000 account balance in your savings before, uh, you know, the collapse of so, uh, New Year's Eve, 1999, then New Year's Day, 2000, you got like 200 bucks and you can't prove the new balance is wrong. That's a nightmare. People started taking their money out of banks because of worries over stuff like this. My, my dad actually took a bunch of his uh, savings. Uh, of course he did. Bought gold with it and then hid the gold in little bags in the walls of our house. Not kidding. Had to hide it, you know, because of all the anarchy and looting that was bound to break out. A lot of loaded guns hidden around the house at the time. You know, the world was definitely going to collapse. How could it not? Y2K, motherfuckers. Come on. And then it didn't. (laughs) And then I think the price of gold went down and he's pretty pissed. Uh, Maybe the, you know, the three and a half percent interest loan you had is, uh, you know, now saying it's 13 and a half percent, you know, all these different things. You're going to, you can't afford your mortgage. You're going to lose your home. A lot of fear in some circles. There's fear that power plants might incorrectly monitor levels and endanger people who live nearby. You know, uh, transportation would suddenly be thrown back a hundred years. All the flight records are scrambled. Maybe the flights, uh, the planes themselves got scrambled, start crashing left and right. It's going to be fucking chaos. 
There's going to be vandalism and looting. Martial law is going to have to be declared. And maybe that was part of the plan all along, sheeple. The trilateralists, the Illuminati, they did this shit on purpose. Chaos by design. Designed so UN forces could infiltrate the U.S., right, start imprisoning citizens in FEMA camps and enslave the population. Welcome to the new world order. For some, there was a lot of paranoia leading up to the year 2000. I remember it very well. Uh, meanwhile, towards the end of the century, thousands and thousands of coders, right? They're pl- employed around the world to, to fix this glitch everywhere from state departments to private companies, right? This makes its way into pop culture. It would be immortalized in pop culture by the brilliant Mike Judge, the cult film Office Space, you know, whose miserable workers were on the, on the job of going through code line by line to correct the error. Peter offers us Office Space's protagonist, explains the problem to his love interest, Joanna, great Jennifer Aniston role. Right? When he's like, uh, she's like, uh, and uh, what do you do there, Peter? I sit in a cubicle and update bank software for the 2000 Switch. What's that? You see, they wrote all this bank software and it saves space. They put 98 instead of 1998. So I go through these thousands of lines of codes and uh, it doesn't really matter. I, I don't like my job. I don't think I'm going to go anymore. <laughs> uh, many people, many of them formerly not apocalyptic thinkers at all, are racing to prepare, right? Not all backwoods doomsday preppers. Police throughout the world are securing emergency bunkers for themselves. FEMA workers gearing up for a potential Y2K emergency. Officials in Miami-Dade County asking residents to have enough food and water stored up for two weeks, which would see the area through a disruption similar to the one caused by Hurricane Andrew in 1992. Time Magazine, right? the Time Incorporated Information Tech uh, staff, they set up a generator-powered war room in the basement of the Time and Life building filled with computers and equipment ready to produce the magazine. In case of a catastrophic breakdown of electricity and communications, wilderness survival boot camps getting a lot more popular. Oh man. NBC even made a made for TV shitty movie about the coming disaster called Y2K released on November 21st, 1999. Here's their sweet trailer. As New Year's approaches, we're starting to see some problems. One thing's on everyone's mind. Oh, my God. What if they're right? <laughs> Y2K the movie and so many explosions. December 21st. So many explosions. What if they're right? I love that guy's voice. <laughs> so many trailers and commercials. Uh, pandemonium. Everything is going to fall apart. Life as you know it will descend into chaos and death. What if they're right? Prepare yourselves. But first... Watch Y2K on NBC this Friday after fucking whatever they have. Uh, yeah, thanks, NBC. Way to, way to stoke some fear during an especially panic time. Might as well uh, help create a, a little possibly deadly pandemonium, stoke some terror fire, anything to sell more beer, soap, and soda. An article in Vanity Fair in January of 1999 uh, wrote about this possibility. It is an instant past midnight. <laughs> I'm going to do the same guy's voice because that's just fun. It is an instant past midnight. January 1, 2000. The power in some cities isn't working. Bank vaults and prison gates have swung open. Hospitals have shut down. So many countries degenerating into riots and revolution. No one will know the extent of its consequences until after they occur. The one thing is that the wondrous... Sorry. The one sure thing is that the wondrous machines that govern and ease our lives won't know what to do. Riots in the streets! Here comes the end, everyone. Oh, boy. Break out that fucking purge siren. Lock your doors. Board up the windows. Shoot trespassers on sight. If you want your family to live, fear, fear the coming purge of Y2K. Uh, Late 90s. Golden age for IT people, survivalists, especially end times, apocalypse mongering, uh, you know, uh, Christian more extremists. Y2K era represented to some strains of Christians, more extreme, punishment for many of the the things they've been worried about for years now. Society had moved too far away from God, become too reliant on technology, too involved in the modern secular world. Now the end times were coming. There was the, uh, the fact that the year 2000 marked the second millennium since the birth of Christ. The book of Revelation could be read, at least by some, to suggest that a millennium meant the uh, beginning of global end times. American televangelist Jerry Falwell proclaimed that, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to stop reading that guy's voice. Y2K may be God's instrument to shake this nation, to humble this nation, to start a revival that spreads over the face of the earth before the rapture of the church. Oh, shit. 
Here we go. Uh, even without the concept of the millennium bug, this kind of paranoia and religious thinking was felt all over the world, including Uganda. In Uganda, a national Y2K task force was established and as 1999 wound down, they addressed the country's fears and announced the readiness of the, excuse me, new nation systems to switch over to the new millennium without incident. Uganda is Y2K compliant. On November 1st, 1999, new vision headline announced. Task force said that uh, the teacher's payroll had been prepared till January 2000 as a contingency. Since teachers, uh, you know, constituted the biggest percentage of public service employees, the National Referral Hospital, Malago, meanwhile, announced that as the new year dawned, it would switch off its most delicate and expensive machines. And I do think these kind of precautions, smart to make, you know, better safe than sorry. Uh, Deputy Hospital Director, Dr. Gideon, uh, it is Dr. Gideon Kikam Pikaho, longer name, uh, said, we shall switch off our automated medical equipment, such as the radiotherapy unit. We shall also take care of specialized technology machines, such as the computerized tomographic machine. Really had to fight using that voice for reading that too. Dr. Kipa Picano, Picaho uh, said, while all the machines in the hospital has been, had been declared Y2K compliant by the National Y2K Task Force, extra care was being taken. He said, uh, we're all anxious today. Nobody knows exactly what's going to happen. We must adjust and accommodate any changes and eventualities. Yeah, okay, so that's practical. Hospital also put on a standby uh, a co uh, consultant surgeon, 11 doctors, 26 nurses, five auxiliary staff to handle any uh, you know unexpected emergencies. And then, of course, the computers did not crash in Uganda or anywhere, or anywhere else. After so much hype, right, there were very few problems in the end. As the clocks rolled over into the new millennium, most things operated as normal. A nuclear energy, uh, a nuclear energy facility in uh, Isha, Ishikawa, Japan, had some of its radiation equipment fail, but backup facilities ensured that there was never any danger to the public. Even countries such as Italy, Russia, South Korea, which had done little to prepare for Y2K, had no more technical problems than the countries who did a lot to prepare, like the U.S., which spent millions and millions on the problem. One woman, Ann Kelsey, put the uh, rollover to a new millennium for the average person this way. She said, uh, <laughs> I stocked up on an array of battery-operated lights, a chemical toilet, plenty of cash, sleeping bags, a battery-operated emergency radio. I'll stop. A uh, full tank of gas and camping gear. My house looked like an REI outpost. On New Year's Eve, I sat with trepidation and watched Sydney, Australia welcome the millennium 12-plus hours before the U.S. East Coast. Smart. The lights stayed on. There were no catastrophic interruptions. The television stations kept broadcasting. I looked over somewhat sheepishly at my pyramid of emergency supplies. The first week of the new century saw the local food bank receive a windfall of canned food. <laughs> as I cleaned out my emergency rations and reflected on my somewhat extreme overreaction. Yeah, the world did not end. Nations around the world, including Uganda, saw the year 2000, uh, you know, didn't really look or feel different than the year 1999. And that created a lot of problems for one small group, Uganda, which had predicted that the end of the world would be on December 31st, 1999. Their third prediction, <laughs> the one they were most sure of, and that would, of course, be the movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God, which had been predicting an ever-moving apocalyptic date that didn't come in 1995, then didn't come in 1997 either. Now the leaders are in some serious trouble. They'd used several end times predictions in order to get their membership, uh, get their members, excuse me, to comply with them, to get them to sell their land, hand their money over to them, to comply with strict schedules that involve days without taking, or excuse me, talking, intensive prayer, uh, beatings. You know, accepting the word uh, of God it was channeled through a woman who had once been a sex worker and a beer brewer uh, before supposedly becoming the Messiah. So now they started making a plan, uh, one that we'll get to soon. Right now, time for an overview of Uganda to show how political and social instability there produced uh, reports of strange religious experiences, experiences that would influence and help the movement achieve its goals. Then, as I stated earlier, we'll look at the movement's leadership and beliefs before heading into today's time -like timeline to experience the full life cycle of this terribly destructive cult. So Uganda, let's meet this interesting nation. Uganda uh, is a country in East Central Africa, bordered by South Sudan to the North, Kenya to the East, uh, Tanzania, Rwanda to the South, the Democratic Republic of the Congo to the West. Its capital city is Kampala, built around seven hills, not far from the shores of Lake Victoria. The suburbs do go on to, you know, the edge of Lake Victoria. Uh, while Kampala's population is just one 1,680,600. Its metro area population is almost 7 million. It's a big, sprawling city described in a number of sources as the most chaotic city in Africa. So many motorbikes, so many shuttle vans, like so many shuttle vans. 
Uh, dirt roads downtown, paved roads in the suburbs, very dense, very crowded in many parts. You know, I was watching some travel videos of uh, people navigating certain parts of downtown. I'm just getting stressed out by like so many people crammed in a small area. Uh, many parts of the city, not a place for a lighthearted, relaxing stroll. Some parts gorgeous, you know, weather is pretty perfect. Average high in the low 80s year round, average low in the low 60s year round, not far from the equator, a lot of sunshine, ideal weather, you know, temperature wise, you know, pretty humid, a lot of rain certain times a year, but uh, very green because of all that. Nature wise is fucking gorgeous. Uh, Lake Victoria, the city butts up against the second largest freshwater lake on earth and the largest in Africa with a surface area of more than 26,000 miles bunch of islands not far out there, you know, many of them populated. Largest lake uh, in the world is actually Lake Superior here in North America, over 31,000 square miles. Outside of this big-ass city on a big-ass lake, most of Uganda's population, you know, remains rural, with only about a sixth of Ugandans living in cities. The Ugandan population has grown rapidly since its independence, uh, when it was approximately 7 million to now an estimated 45 million people. Largest age group, 48% consists of those who are 14 and under, only 2% of Ugandans over the age of 65, and that's not good. We'll soon see why that is. Size-wise, Uganda, about the size of Great Britain, populated by dozens of ethnic groups, mostly due to the fact that when it obtained formal independence on October 9th, 1962, its borders were ones that had been drawn, you know, in an artificial and arbitrary manner by European colonizers based on other colonizers' demands, based on one European country not wanting to go to war with another European country as opposed to doing what's best for the people living in that area. Uh, we talked a lot about, uh, you know, how badly European colonizers, colonizers, how they made a mess of Africa in Time Suck episode 72 with the borders, the colonial devastation of Africa. Outside of a few nations like South Africa, colonized by the Dutch in the 17th century, most of Africa was colonized uh, much more recently. Beginning in the late 19th century, lasting until, until World War I, not that long ago, several European colonial powers raced to carve up Africa, consume valuable natural resources, and when they carved out territorial borders, they did so without thinking about who was fucking living inside any of these borders. All Africans, not the same at all. There is, uh, you know, more diversity actually than there is in Europe. Uh, you know, like, uh, just like the Scottish, not the same as the Italians, the Zulu, not the same as the Bantu, uh, Bantu. And within the Bantu, there are so many different subcultures, just like how there are different groups of Celtic or Germanic people in Europe. And as any, any student of history knows, uh, a lot of times different groups of people fucking hate each other, right? They take each other's resources, kill each other's warriors, kidnap and rape each other's women, enslave each other's children, et cetera, et cetera. And when outside oppressors decide that different ethnic and cultural groups are now all citizens of the same nation, well, uh, problems are going to arise. And then when colonizers leave and a power vacuum is created, civil wars almost always start. The various groups who have had their uh, hatred of each other suppressed by the colonizers, colonizers, you know, attack each other all over again, off with more vigor, like they're making up for lost time as they struggle for control over what will now, uh, uh, you know, who will run now the new nation, left with the same arbitrary borders that the colonizers drew up. And this happened to just about all of Africa's nations, including Uganda. Uganda's borders essentially encompass two different societies, the centralized Bantu, Bantu Kingdom, excuse me, of the South and the uh, more decentralized uh, Nilotic and Sudanic peoples to the North. Bantu speakers from the largest portion of Uganda's population or form it. And of these, the Ganda remain the largest single ethnic group, about a sixth of the total national population. Other uh, uh, Bantu speakers, I, can't, I, I didn't put the pronunciation for that one. I was like, I was positive. I remember looking at it and be like, yeah, my instinct was right. And now I'm like, what was my instinct? <laughs> was it Bantu or Bantu? I think it's Bantu. Other Bantu speakers include, and, and again, forgive my pronunciation, there's no guide that I can find that lists out how to say the majority of these. All the videos I can find from many of them are in the language of the tribe that I'm trying to figure out how to pronounce. So I have no fucking clue when they're saying the word I'm looking for, if they're saying the word I'm looking for. There are the Sola, uh, Weri, Gisu, uh, Nilon, Samia, Toro, Nioro, Kiga, uh, Niankole, Amba, and Janjo. But, uh, but uh, Nilotic languages spoken by, and again, not a clue how to say most of these words, uh, the Acholi, Lango, Alur, Padhola, Kumam, Tiso, uh, Karamojong, Kakwa, uh, Sebi groups, they're known by more than one-tenth of the population. At least 32 languages are spoken in Uganda. English, Swahili, Ganda, uh, they are the most commonly used. Religion-wise, Uganda is home to three major religious affiliations, 
kind of, uh, indigenous religions, of which there are many subsets, and then Islam and Christianity. So, you know, uh, really a bunch of different like religions. Traditional indigenous uh, beliefs practiced in some rural areas, sometimes blended with or practiced alongside Christianity or Islam and more urban areas. For an example of a local belief system, the Ganda people or Baganda, uh, they're a Bantu ethnic group native to Baganda, a sub-national kingdom within Uganda. You can kind of think of it like um, in America, similar to like, you know, what the Cherokee Nation used to be. Uh, for an example of a local belief system. Oh, sorry. Uh, I already read that part. Got distracted in my own head. 26.6% of Ugandans live in the Uganda kingdom, a Bantu kingdom, several hundred Bantu languages, roughly four fucking hundred distinct ethnic groups who speak Bantu languages. Overall, there are 3,000 different ethnic groups speaking more than 2,100 different languages in all of Africa. Like I said, it's very diverse. For comparison, uh, some 160 culturally distinct groups in Europe. While about 200 different languages are spoken across Europe, only 24 native to Europe. Only Asia has more languages than Africa, roughly 2,300, but not really because that's counting all the South Pacific Island cultures not actually on the Asian continent. Uh, the United States, the great melting pot, might look like the most diverse uh, uh, place to many, like, you know, like New York City, San Francisco, at first glance, you see white, black, brown, Asian, Pacific Islander, Nordic, African, Russian, South American, on and on, people from all over the world. To the untrained eye, a lot of people will not see a lot of diversity in a place like Uganda. They'll see a lot of black people and assume the culture is way more homogenized than it actually is. But those black people are not the same and many will be offended at the presumption of that kind or any presumption of that kind. Now, when I had the pleasure of spending a month in South Africa many years ago uh, doing stand-up, I got in some conversations with some locals, found out real quick just how diverse the nation was, how, how, how differently racism can look. We're like, here if the old stereotype is a white dad not wanting his uh, white daughter to marry a black man. In Uganda, that could be a member of one of the nation's 56 different tribes forbidding his daughter to marry a dude from one of the other 56 tribes because that dude is from a tribe that he considers to be savage, dirty, lazy, insert whatever random slanderous description you want there. But back to the indigenous beliefs of some members of the Baganda kingdom. Sorry, hard to not get uh, pulled off course with all this shit. Uh, this information does pertain to our story. Right? All that diversity being ignored by colonial oppressors created a lot of instability uh, when they left, which led to a lot of death and chaos. And out of that chaos and death, easier for a cult, like the movement, to develop and grow. Right, Chaos begets more chaos. Uh, also got distracted because this historical shit fascinates me and kind of pisses me off. Right, Mad that I learned almost fucking none of this shit in school. Outrageous how little Americans growing up are, are taught about Africa or Asia or South America U.S. educational system is so Western European uh, centric. And even then we don't, or at least I didn't even learn that much about Europe, just America, like the rest of the world doesn't exist, right? No wonder there's uh, you know big pockets of nationalism. Maybe a lot of you did learn more than I did. I didn't exactly receive a Rhodes Scholar level of education back in Idaho County. <laughs> but indigenous beliefs now for real. Doesn't sound like many uh, Ugandans practice uh, this religion anymore. And when they do, how they worship varies considerably from village to village, family to family as there was no central text, just oral tradition. The Baganda believed in a spirit world beyond the one that they could see, and this belief featured strongly in their lives, both at the personal level as well as in matters of state. The occupants of the spirit uh, world can be considered to be on three levels in this belief system. At the top, a supreme creator, Katanda. That name, uh, meaning creator of all things and lord of creation, indicates that he is recognized to be superior to all, was referred to as the father of the gods, think Zeus, Many years ago, uh, there were three main shrines dedicated to Katanda in the Baganda kingdom. There were priests dedicated to his worship. However, little was known of the supreme god, and he was not expected to intervene routinely in human affairs. This, now now my, I, I pulled an audible and I said Zeus, but actually I think Zeus had a dad. Uh, I didn't, forget, my, uh, forget my Greek analogy. It kind of works, but maybe not 100%. Uh, the second level is uh, Lubale, of which there are more than two dozen minor deities. Lubales were of major significance to the Baganda nation. In the day-to-day -day life of the people, the word Lubali was translated as God by early writers in English on Buganda, uh, but the histories of the Lubalis, which were well-known to the Buganda, all tell of them having been humans, who having shown exceptional powers when alive were venerated after death and whose spirits were expected to intercede favorably in national affairs when asked. So they're more like the saints of Christian belief than true gods. They are referred to, especially within uh, Catholicism, they're referred to by many as guardians, Guardians were the focus of the organized religious activity of the kingdom, being recognized and venerated by all. 
Even more important, they were the one institution which the king, otherwise uh, almost an absolute ruler, could not ignore or disrespect without angering his people and perhaps being dethroned. Before all major national events, such as coronations and wars, the oracles at the major temples were consulted and offerings were made. The guardians had various shrines, like how ancient Greeks, Romans, Egyptians, Vikings, Aztecs, etc. had shrines for their various gods. And each shrine was uh, headed by a priest or priestess, the mandwa, who, when the guardian spirit was upon him or her, also functioned as an oracle. Generally, the mandwa for a particular temple was assigned to one clan of people who would supply the priests and priestesses for the temple. Each guardian had at least one temple in which uh, was kept a set of sacred drums, other ceremonial objects. The building and upkeep of the temples was governed by very elaborate and exacting rituals. The most popular guardian was Mukasa, guardian of the lake. He had temples in his honor all over the country, but the chief temple was on uh, Bubembe Island in Lake Victoria. To this temple, the king would send an annual offering to cows and a request for prosperity and good harvests. Next, his temple was one to his wife, Nalwanga, to whom women could pray for fertility. The other nationally renowned guardian was Kibuka. His legend tells that he was a general of such great prowess that it was said of him that he could fly like a bird over the battlefield. The guardian of wars temple was sadly desecrated by British colonizers. Many of the contents either spread out around the world in various museum collections or in the hands of private collectors or just lost to history. About 80% of Uganda's population is Christian, primarily divided between Roman Catholics and Protestants. But a lot of those Christians, uh, you know, also are people who believed in the types of religions I just explained. It all just kind of got blended. So it's a little bit more mystical. Christian missionaries didn't arrive in Uganda until the end of the 19th century. And in many parts of rural Uganda until, you know, well after that, uh, about an eighth of the population is Muslim. And yeah, the rest still just only practicing traditional religions like I just described. Like in other parts of Africa, Islam, Christianity have been combined uh, again with ind indigenous religions to form syncretic religious trends. And the blending created mystical versions of, you know, Islam and, and Christianity created beliefs that have uh, seen more change in recent years, which allows the splinter groups cults ideas to not seem quite so radical. Right. Christianity came to Uganda during the colonial period through spirited missionary activity. Okay, let's break away from establishing how diverse diverse Uganda is now in its religious makeup and talk about how tribal divisions led to a lot of political instability, the background of the people who grew up to become these cults members and rulers. Under British colonial rule, the economic power and education was concentrated in the South. As a result, the Bantu people, who made up the majority of the new nation's population in the South, came to dominate modern Uganda, occupying most of the high academic, judicial, bureaucratic, and religious positions, and a whole range of other prestigious roles. However, the British then recruited overwhelmingly from the north for the armed forces, police, and paramilitary forces. And the Nilotic tribes made up the north, collectively sometimes referred to as the Luo people of Uganda. So while economic power lay in the south, military power concentrated in the north, and this imbalance, these two group, groups have historically not gotten along that well. This imbalance, to a large extent, shaped the political events of post-colonial Uganda. British colonizers seemed to ignore how different these two groups were, how much they did not get along. And they would simply see a magical place full of wildlife and precious resources, not the instability they were actively creating. As Winston Churchill would write, Uganda is a fairy tale. You climb up a railway instead of a beanstalk. And at the end, there is a wonderful new world. He'd call it the Pearl of Africa, but he didn't really understand it. After achieving independence, things in Uganda would be shaky at best. Uganda formally achieved its independence from the UK, became a member of the Commonwealth of Nations, October 9th, 1962. Milton Obote, leader of Ugandan People's Congress, became prime minister. Edward Frederick Mutesa II, king of Buganda, elected president, October 9th, 1963. Almost immediately, several government soldiers rebel against the government near Lake Victoria. Starts January 23rd, 1964, and Prime Minister Abote uh, requests British military assistance. January 24th, the next day, some 500 British troops, not nearly enough, deployed in support of the government on January 25th, but the British would withdraw from the county, or the country, excuse me, August 1st of, August 1st of that year. With the British, uh, with the, excuse me, with the Prime Minister assuming emergency powers, uh, President Mutesa was deposed. And then he later led a rebellion against the government in 1966. A new constitution is written uh, a year later, but then in 1969, President Abote declares a state of emergency and bans all opposition political parties. The chaos is beginning. Then just two years later, President Abote deposed in a military coup by General Idi Amin, January 25th, 1971. 
General Amin appoints himself president for life, naturally, as one does. And President Abote heads into exile in Tanzania. General Amin, uh, very important to today's story. This guy's a motherfucker. Uh, a member of the small Kakwa ethnic group of northwestern Uganda, Amin had little formal education, joined the King's African Rifles of the British Colonial Army in 1946 as an assistant cook, then quickly rose to the ranks, became one of the few Ugandan soldiers elevated to officer ranks before independence is achieved in 1962. After his successful military coup, he becomes president, right, chief of the armed forces uh, in 1971, field marshal 1975, president for life 1976. But really, he was, you know, leading things as a dictator just the whole time. Just, you know, fucking titles don't really matter. Came to power in an era marked by instability and poor economic conditions, including a cattle population that was declining significantly because of disease, cattle rustling, malnutrition, which left the population rightfully worried about starvation. And then Amin would fix everything. No, of course not. No, he'd make everything so much fucking worse. He was a huge piece of shit. Like many dictators, Amin ruled directly, shunning the delegation of power. He was noted for his abrupt changes of mood, also known for being a fucking idiot in uh, many ways. Uh, the leader of Uganda, now someone who's borderline illiterate, known for being gentle in some moments, uh, a tyrant in others, but mostly a tyrant. Instead of working on uh, Uganda's economic or political stability, Amin expelled all Asians from Uganda, just fucking all of them, get out, 1972. An action that led directly to the breakdown of Uganda's economy. Also publicly insulted Great Britain, the U.S., as well as numerous other world leaders, really isolated himself from any help from anybody else. Uh, took a tribalism, uh, he took tribalism, excuse me, a longstanding problem in Uganda to its extreme by ordering the persecution of Echoli, Longo, and other ethnic groups, right? Just like, let's fucking kill these people. Amin came to be known as the butcher of Uganda for his brutality. Estimated that hundreds of thousands of people were killed, countless others tortured as a direct result of his rule. Even had a personal murder murder factory, a pink L-shaped building high on Nakasero Hill in Kampala. The official name for this murder factory was the State Research Bureau. The SRB sounds pretty benign. Uh, the bureau had uh, little to do with affairs of state. Uh, research wasn't the uh, type of thing you'd see taking place in uh, uh, this building. It was actually the headquarters for uh, Idi Amin's dreaded secret police. Here, enemies of the state, just people he didn't like, brought for slaughter. Officers became torture, uh, offices, excuse me, became torture chambers where crazed agents of Amin, you know, strangled, tortured, shot, beheaded victims. Sometimes as many as 20 would die uh, in a single day. An Anglican pastor, the Reverend George Lukwia, was one of the few survivors of this place. And he said, one day, the secret police picked me up saying that I had made an attempt to assassinate President Amin. It was a ridiculous charge, but there was no convincing these people. So they brought me to the SRB. Didn't take them long to strip me, start beating me. Many of my attackers were high on drugs and alcohol. Every time they tortured me, I thought it would soon be all over. They kept demanding a confession, but I had nothing to confess. So they just continued to beat me with the butts of their rifles. For three months, I lived in constant fear. And quite often I would pray, God, please let me die quickly. And uh, at one time, I found myself in a 10 foot by 16, 10, 10 by 16 foot room with 60 other prisoners, 60 people in a 10 by 16 foot room. Every day, one of those men would either die or be murdered. Usually the guards would just leave the dead bodies there in the cell. Often we had corpses all around us for more than a week. The smell was horrible. We tried to pile them up in a corner and cover them. Sometimes we'd go for two weeks without water. Prisoners became so thirsty they drank each other's urine. We considered ourselves lucky if we got food twice a week. This reverend once watched guards kill another prisoner with a fucking hammer. Said it took him about 10 minutes. Women often died more quickly because the guards would often just uh, simply cut their throats, but only usually after they've been raped. People were brought to the factory, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, people were brought to the factory by a mean secret agents who would speed through villages and their Land Rovers and private automobiles and just fucking kidnaps people. Uh, the killers would bind victims with ropes, throw them to the ground, shoot them or uh, douse them with gasoline, set them on fire if they didn't bring them back to be tortured. Screams for mercy, death screams would ring out to the surrounding blocks around this uh, murder factory. While Amin targeted many, really anyone opposed to his regime, he had it out for Christians in particular. As a Muslim, he wanted to declare Uganda a Muslim state, despite the fact that the overwhelming, the, the vast majority of Ugandans were Christian. I mean, spies would often sit quietly in church services. Days later, certain members of the congregation would just disappear. Most simply shot. Others, again, you know, tortured. Some actually uh, fed to crocodiles like they were fucking mice being fed to a snake. 
This son of a bitch was as ruthless and sadistic as any serial killer we have ever covered, but he had a lot of minions doing most of the actual killing for him and ended up with a far higher body count. To be a Christian living under a means regime was to constantly fear that you were about to be tortured and killed. Uh, when that is the climate you're living in, does the apocalypse really seem all that bad? Uh, might you maybe start rooting for the apocalypse, right? Or, or, or would it cause you to walk away from God? This chaos and death created a lot of wavering faith for many Ugandan uh, Christians, you know, uh, Ugandan Christians, excuse me, people left wondering how their God would let such a thing happen. This would be very important in the story of the movement, right? Going back to the timeline in October of uh, 1978, I mean, ordered an attack on Tanzania. Aided by Ugandan nationalists, Tanzanian troops eventually overpowered the Ugandan army. As the Tanzanian-led forces neared Kampala, Uganda's uh, capital on April 11th, 1979, I mean, fled. He was succeeded by pres uh, as president by Yusufu Lule. Two days later, after escaping first to Libya, Amin made it to uh, Saudi Arabia, would remain there until his death in 2003. The butcher lived comfortably until he was either 78 or 77 or 78. So that's a bummer. After his departure, the legacy of instability in Uganda lived on during the conflict with Tanzania. Around uh, 3,500 people were killed, including some 440 Tanzanian soldiers, 200 Libyan soldiers, Around 100,000 people, regular civilians amongst them, uh, displaced. Political corruption in Uganda is rife throughout all of this. Bribes are common. Taxes not used to help people, but to make politicians and their minions wealthy at the expense of the people. President Lule only ruled for a few months. So much instability. Followed by President Godfrey uh, Benaisa, who ruled for less than a year. <laughs> then Paulo Mwanga also ruled less than a year. Mwanga is brutal as a mean. Mwanga chaired the ruling military commission that organized the December 1980 general elections. The Ugandan People's Congress was declared winner of those elections, though they were marred by multiple irregularities. I mean, the election was completely rigged. Now for a second time, previously ruling as Prime Minister, Milton Obote becomes president of Uganda. He'll run this uh, fucking shit show for four and a half years. During his tenure, Uganda is hit hard by the AIDS pandemic. Really fucking kicked to the nuts when they're already down. Economy still in shambles. Some residents in southern Uganda believed that the Tanzanian soldiers introduced HIV into the region during the war with Tanzania, spreading the disease by raping civilians. And that might be true. In 1982, the first causes of what they called slim disease at that time uh, was identified. The disease not recognized as being AIDS until 1985. During this time, it spreads rapidly, uh, reaches epidemic proportions. Most people there don't know that. Uh, Yoweri Museveni becomes president in 1986. And this dude is still fucking president. We've been running the show for over 36 years now. Many consider him a dictator who, much like Putin, right, holds rigged elections to make it seem like he just keeps being the people's choice. And like Putin, he changes term limit laws, you know, uh, age, you know, uh, limit laws, things like that in order to stay in power. But at least he's better than Amin and several other previous brutal rulers. Um, Museveni learned of his country's AIDS problem from Cuba's president, Fidel Castro. Uh, at the September 1986, you know, former president, of course, he's passed on now. Uh, the September 1986 meeting of non-aligned heads of state, Castro pulled Museveni aside and he said, uh, he told me that of the 60 soldiers we had sent to Cuba for training, 18 of them had the AIDS virus. He was therefore worried that it may reflect what level of prevalence was in the population. President Museveni then spearheaded a massive education campaign promoting a three-pronged AIDS prevention message. Abstinence from sexual activity until marriage, monogamy within marriage, condoms as a last resort. Oh boy. Maybe should have led with condoms. These fuckers never want to be realistic and align PSAs with basic human nature. Uh, the message was marketed as ABC. Abstinence, be faithful, use a condom. Uh, okay. Uh, this message also addressed a, a high rate of concurrency in Uganda, which refers to the widespread cultural practice uh, there at the time of maintaining two or more sexual partners, uh, you know, simultaneously. It was rare for a Ugandan man to have just one woman. Infidelity was culturally pretty expected, if not, you know, condoned. Uh, mass media campaigns also targeting this practice included the zero grazing and love carefully public health messages in the 1990s. <laughs> zero grazing. That's a weird image. Just picture a cow just uh, grazing through a field of puss. Uh, in total, it's estimated that 400,000 to 450,000 Ugandans died from HIV AIDS, most in the 80s and 90s. At some point in the late 80s, early 90s, HIV AIDS uh, associated with the death of about 50% of adults in some areas of Uganda. 
The epidemic reached a peak in the 80s before later dropping off in the in the 90s. Not only were people dying of AIDS at this time, but the economy still tanking, uh, tanking to the point that it led many to die from starvation and other illnesses. The economy had deteriorated under the rule of President Amin from 1971 to 1979. He'd expelled many of the country's prominent business owners. Many just fled so they wouldn't be fucking tortured and killed. He'd increased spending on military goods, all of which led to the economy being almost completely destroyed by the 1980s. The economic and political destruction of the Amin years contributed to a record decline in earnings. They dropped by almost 15% between 1978 and 1980. Man, when Amin fled in 1979, the nation's GDP measured only 80% of the 1970 level. That's terrible. Industry declined sharply as equipment, spare parts, raw materials became scarce. Uganda just barely escaped widespread famine in the late 70s and early 80s, only because many people, even urban residents, reverted to substance cultivation in order to survive, bartering food for other goods. This society is going backwards. Of course, this causes problems with regulation and taxation, leading to more instability, fluctuation in the economy. Then there would be even more political upheaval when Museveni's new national resistance movement seizes power in January of 86. Luckily, their program for economic rehabilitation would secure some semblance, semblance of political stability, security, and law and order. But in the midst of all this instability, years and years of it, many Ugandans turned to some weird religious shit to cope with living in a continually burning fucking dumpster fire. These poor people, disease, war, brutal leaders who tortured and killed them, borderline famine, uh, starvation, no financial stability, right? This was all uh, many Ugandans living in extreme poverty had ever known. All this shook the faith of many of Ugandans Catholics. The Catholic Church in Uganda had once been a fruitful mix of local religious tradition and institutional authority from the church with multiple lay orders like the Brothers of Charles Luanga, the Sisters of the Virgin, the Little Sisters of St. Francis. The church was known as the uh, place where the Kabaka, the spiritual king of the Bugando people dwelt. And the Virgin Mary was also Africanized. There were other imaginative translations of Christian concepts into local terms, such as referring to the guardian angel as a blood brother. Basically, Ugandan Catholics had blended again, right? As I spoke before, their local traditions with Catholic ones, forming beliefs that supplemented each side of the traditions and, and created a pretty robust Catholic population there. But now with so many years of fucking death, destruction, chaos, corruption, a lot of Catholic faith is wavering. People are becoming, of course, pessimistic, fatalistic. The faithful becoming less faithful by the day. Though Catholics were now free to practice their religion openly, unlike how it had been actually for a while during the Amin rule, many of the clergy members killed off in Amin's killing factories or just sometimes fucking assassinated on the street, uh, leaving a vacuum in the leadership. In this void, many Catholic groups formed in the late 80s. Uh, but these confused and traumatized people wouldn't turn to the old blend of indigenous religion and Catholicism. Instead, they turned to charismatic self-declared messiahs who renounced the authority of the government and the church with these new groups. Many of these fuckers, insanely corrupt, big old crop of cult leaders springing up, chaos, creating more and more chaos. The movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God would be just one of uh, many of these groups. Now, a lot of these groups, like the Holy Spirit movement, had leaders who claimed to receive virgin, vision excuse me, from the Virgin Mary or of the Virgin Mary. Even non-cult leaders were seeing the Virgin Mary. She was fucking busy. She was appearing all over East Central Africa in the 80s and 90s. One early appearance of Mary was on November 28th, 1991, when Alphonsine uh, Mumureke, a 16-year-old Catholic school student at uh, Kibeho High School in Rwanda, claimed to see a lady of incomparable beauty who presented herself under the name that means Mother of the Word. Alphonsine immediately recognized her as the Virgin Mary, but not everyone believed her. At first, Alphonsine was viewed as a crazy or unhappy girl, maybe possessed by evil, or according to some, a, a mediocre student wanting to play a prank to make her more accepted at her high school. According to one source, students and teachers said they'd believe her if the Virgin Mary appeared again to anyone besides Alphonsine. Allegedly, Alphonsine asked the Virgin to respond to the challenge by appearing to others. Short time later, two new alleged seers appeared in the high school, one after the other, two of her fellow students in 1982. Different witnesses interrogated, uh, you know, Kiboho, uh, excuse me, uh, Kiboho, yeah, high school in 1982 and declared that they, uh, uh, you know, were, were believing them. They believed that these apparitions uh, were real. More people start claiming to see the apparitions, you know, more still. Apparently the Virgin asked everybody to convert, keep faith, uh, pray without hypocrisy, uh, pray to prevent, you know, terrible wars and more visions. In August of 1982, witnesses report seeing violence, dismembered corpses, destruction. Stories of these visions quickly make their way to Uganda, where fringe religious movements are already taking hold. 
1986, a girl from Rwanda claiming a connection with the apparition seen in that school in Kibeho, uh, sightings now recognized by the Roman Catholic Church, instantly attracts crowds. She later moves to uh, Mubehe in the, in the diocese of Masaka, where our cult today will begin to grow. Interestingly, the messages alleged, uh, allegedly received from heaven put great emphasis upon AIDS, exactly as the literature of the movement for the restoration will do. Uh, the Virgin Mary expected to reveal a cure for AIDS, according to uh, this week's cult at one point. Okay, now, with all this background in mind, now let's meet the leaders of the movement. The crazy leaders, fucking growing up in a chaotic place. The five primary leaders were Joseph Kibuteri, uh, Joseph uh, Kasapurari, John Kama- Kamagara, Dominic Kataribabu, and Credonia Mwinde. Joseph uh, Kibuteri was maybe kind of initially the main leader of the movement, though this is somewhat up for debate. Uh, we'll get into actually uh, who ran the group in just a bit. And we don't know much about this guy. Many details of Joseph's life, especially his death, remain unclear. Uh, we do know that he was born in 1932. We know he came from a strongly uh, pious Catholic background, likely wealthy by Ugandan standards. Uh, we know that because he ran for political office in 1980, apparently self-funded, and had enough land to donate uh, some some land to found a, his own school, which he would design. The Catholic school he founded was a run-of-the-mill school, not a cult, and allowed him to bolster his image in the eyes of the community, he gave him a lot of credibility. Also know that in 1960, he married a woman named Teresa. At the time, he was working as an assistant supervisor of the area's Catholic schools, later became a government overseer of building and agricultural projects. And then Joseph and Teresa would eventually have 16 children together. Fucking 16! Coming out of one vagina. That's that's rough math. That poor woman. Uh, I picture her uh, by the end there tucking her uterus into her sock. Uh, at some point, the family moved to uh, Rashamire, where they owned several properties, hundreds of cattle, and a milling business. So they're killing it. And then he would start to see strange visions. Or so he claimed. Maybe he saw visions. Maybe he saw opportunities for a man who saw visions. But he probably saw visions. Uh, as we'll learn towards the end of the episode, he uh, he did definitely suffer some some mental illness. The atmosphere of Uganda that we just covered, one of chaos and superstition, illness, and a need to believe in miracles may have influenced him quite a bit with his uh, visions. April of 1984, Joseph would first claim sightings of the Virgin Mary. In the first supposed vision, the message of the Blessed Virgin Mary to him was that there was widespread moral decadence, which would result in perdition in Christian theology, a state of eternal punishment and damnation into which a sinful and unpentient person passes after death. Uh, penitent, unless people the world uh, you know, over change their ways, reinstituted a life based on the biblical Ten Commandments. Soon after that, he founds the movement. His wife is the first convert to join. I mean, yeah, sure, I get it. Where's she going? All right, she's tied to this dude through 16 kids. Then around 1989, he will meet a woman named Credonia Mwinde, the main... Uh, <laughs> the main star, I guess, of our show today. Uh, if the group's organizational structure and ability to raise funds and avoid law enforcement scrutiny came from Joseph, many of the group's core messages will come from Credonia, the real cult leader. She's born in 1952. Some sources have varying years. Most settle around 1952. Uh, you know, had a long history of having the kind of sightings that Joseph claimed to have back in 84. She claimed she could see the Virgin Mary when looking at a stone in the mountains. That the stone was the spitting image of the woman who had given birth to Jesus. Huh, I'd like to see that rock. Having a hard time uh, imagining uh, just a random natural rock uh, looking exactly like Jesus' mom. Not unless she was, you know, extremely unattractive. I doubt any woman wants to be told by anyone that they just saw a rock who looked exactly like her. Uh, Credonia's visions may have come from her family's influence. Her father, Paulo Kashaku, uh, claimed to have had a vision of his dead daughter, Evangelista, as early as 1960. Apparently, everyone's having fucking visions back then. Mother Mary talking to a lot of people in a country that's being motherfucked by poverty, AIDS, war, corrupt, ruthless rulers, etc. Man, if I was hearing about all this back then, I'd be getting pretty pissed at her. Uh, hey, Mary, uh, less cameos, much more actual help, okay? <laughs> Fuck the drop-ins. Let's cure AIDS or shit, uh, you know, some shit already. Uh, at least give us a decent ruler. Little actual help for once would be nice. Uh, the apparition of Paulo's dead daughter told him that uh, he would continue to have visions of heaven. That's cool. A vision that you're going to have more visions. Very helpful. Come on, Mayor Bear. At least give uh, one of these uh, vision beholders a cool t-shirt or something. This prediction passed in 1988 uh, when he saw Jesus Christ, the Virgin Mary, and St. Joseph. He thought his visions were complete. 
He'd had his tour. Now Jesus and company had other appearances to make, busy schedule, I'm sure. Gradonia evidently took up uh, evidently took up the family business. And in 1989, Gradonia and her sister Ursula traveled through Uganda, spreading the family's messages. By that time, uh, she'd had an eventful life that included divorce and remarriage and some kind of concubinage, according to one source. She was allegedly despised in her community for being infertile, as well as for being a barmaid in her hometown of Kunungu. Uh, Kunungu, excuse me. A few sources also said she worked as a sex worker for a couple years before uh, helping run a cult. So then uh, she abandoned her life, focused on receiving and passing uh, on her messages. In one of uh, her sessions, she leads uh, her band of followers back to uh, the Niabogato Caves, the former center of the activities of the Nyabingi, an ancient or traditional oracle of fertility. The messages that came from the visions were then recorded on tapes, which were then distributed. So what were those super helpful and important messages? According to Credonia, the Virgin Mary had informed her that she had returned to save the world from destruction. Nice! Fuck yeah, bro! Big stakes. Right? The biggest. The Virgin Mary went on to tell Credonia that God was angry. Uh, right? That, uh, you know, people aren't following uh, uh, all his uh, teachings. But how is she supposed to save the world? Uh, Mary said that the Ten Commandments were being broken by humanity too much. And God in his anger was now deciding to destroy them. As in all of humanity. The Virgin Mary, however, then pleaded with God to allow Jesus and her to return to earth in order to command humanity to repent and obey the Ten Commandments before it's too late. And then God, greatest mind in the galaxy, source of all wisdom and knowledge, master and creator of the universe, responded telling her that, nah, they can suck my motherfucking nuts. I'd rather shove all the Jupiter up my asshole and let these dipshits enjoy another slice of apple pie or bunt cake. No more spaghetti or tacos, or blowjobs, or rolling clitoral orgasms, or back rubs, or anything fun for these dumb fuck, uh, hairless pieces of shit. I, I hate them all, especially the Polish ones. And then God projectile vomited to emphasize his holy disgust with humanity. Gosh dang. That's not what Cardonia said happened. No, she said that God told Mary, you cannot manage... I'm, I'm gonna do the movie voice again. You cannot manage them. They are spoilt. I sent them my only son, Jesus Christ, who taught them, counseled them, cured their sickness made their cripples walk, restored sight to the blind, and made the dumb speak. Instead of being grateful to him for all of this, they made him suffer. Instead of becoming righteous, they killed him. Let me deal with them as they deserve and give them what they merit. <laughs> like the Michael Bay explosions. I don't know about this vision. God doesn't seem too forgiving here. Also, he seems a little checked out regarding what's been going on uh, on earth, you know, for the past couple thousand years. Yeah, Jesus was treated poorly, very poorly by, by, by a few guys. Almost 2,000 years ago. Why are people in Uganda getting in trouble for that in the 1990s? Talk about a delayed reaction. And humanity has been punished plenty. Hello, bubonic plagues, manifest destiny, the Holocaust, Crusades, Stalin, so many wars, famines, sieges, cities sacked, people raped, enslaved, etc. A lot of punishment already been dished out. Uh, Credonia said that the Virgin Mary then prostrated herself before God asked for the chance to save at least a few thousand souls. Come on, please, from destruction. In this vision, Jesus also supported his mom, imploring his father to allow her to return to earth and undertake the mission. Is God a loving, omnipotent being in this vision or like an angry dad in a lifetime network melodrama? I'm waiting for him to get drunk and start slapping Mary around in front of his uh, son. Seemingly moved by these requests, God does give both of them his permission. Be, you know, be not, not excited. Begrudgingly gives permission to spread the word to the world, telling them, if only a few repent, it is those only that I will forgive. If there are many, so many will be saved. Even if one repents alone, he will also be forgiven. Nice. Opening the cult door here. Come with me, kid. I'll, I alone will spare you from God's wrath. Cult, cult, cult. With all these messages in her mind, clearly laying the groundwork to form a small group of the faithful, uh, she will meet Joseph. In 1991, Joseph Kibuteri travels to uh, Nyamitanga, Uganda to hear Credonia Mwinde. The two apparently, apparently uh, get along like a house on fire. <laughs> Pun intended. Uh, they validate each other's own experiences or cons. According later to Joseph's son, Rugambwe, the next thing we knew, she was in our house and they decided to start their cult here. Son is using the word cult. Soon she was beating us all. My father was in awe of her and would do anything she said. This would lead to their forming the movement. Uh, Naya Matanga became the headquarters of the movement for three years until they moved to Kanagu, Kanagu in 1994. By this time, Kibuteri had separated from his wife and had been excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church. Why did they get separated? Sources don't say. 
But I have to think in part because he and Credonia, they had to be fucking right. Probably. Or maybe he's crazy. He just finally became too much for his wife. And she's like, I'm taking our 16 kids and I'm, I'm leaving. Uh, the pair leads, uh, you know, this new uh, cult they start. Accounts vary as to which one held ultimate authority, but most say Credonia. Throughout the 90s, the group grew rapidly, uh, also attracted several defrocked Catholic priests and nuns who worked as theologians for them, rationalizing messages from the leadership, putting it in the right language for the followers. Two early arrivals uh, were the excommunicated priest Paul Icazir and Dominic Katibabo. Dominic, uh, oh, Kataribabo was particularly important to the group's authority. He was a respected, popular priest with a PhD from the U.S. Uh, the Los Angeles Archdiocese uh, records would show that Kati Kitari Babo was awarded a full Loyola Marymount scholarship in 1985 under a university program benefiting third world priests. Uh, university spokesman at the time, Norm Schneider, reviewing Kitari Babo's records, said he seemed to be pretty ordinary. He seems uh, undistinguished. Well, nevertheless, he'd, he'd go do some shit. Uh, Kitari Babo lived at St. Anthony's Parish Rectory in El Segundo just south of L.A., not far from LAX. I've been by it. He graduated in 1987. Then uh, the ordained priest from Uganda left the U.S. on July 10th, 1987, right? Heading back. No more In-N-Out Burger, no more Poncho's Tacos, uh, much more cult. Back in Uganda, he would soon be disciplined by his Ugandan bishop who reprimanded and eventually excommunicated him in the early 90s for raising funds for the movement cult. He eventually left the church, worked exclusively for the movement. He's now assumed to be dead having perished on March 17, 2000, like much of the movement's members. Paul Ikazir, uh, I can't figure out really how to pronounce his name, uh, different story. Paul was a former Roman Catholic priest who joined the cult in his early days, but then broke away in the mid-90s, which of course allowed him to survive and give interviews following the mass suicide slash murders. Mr. Ikazir told reporters, we joined the movement as a protest against the Catholic Church. We had good intentions. The church was backsliding. The priests were covered in scandals and the AIDS scourge was taking its toll on the faithful. The world seemed poised to end. A lot of people uh, and sources for this story refer to quote unquote scandals in the Catholic church in Uganda in the 80s and 90s, but never say exactly what the scandals were. Based on the interviews of some African priests decades later, it seems the local papers did mention a lot of accusations of sexual abuse. Uh, sadly, of course, uh, the stories just did not circulate uh, into worldwide news. Beginning in 1994, the movement developed as an uh, ordered community, adherents accepting a disciplined life and new behavioral rules as conditions of membership. Its primary center was in Kanunga. Other groups emerged at several nearby towns. And as it grew, their system of belief got uh, stranger and stranger, influenced by uh, more and more of Credonia's so-called visions. Oh boy, here comes the fun part. Let's get into these beliefs now. On one level, the movement's tenets couldn't have been more basic. Follow the Ten Commandments and preach the word of Jesus Christ. Before we get into their crazy, let's establish what are the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments are written about in the book Exodus, second book of the Christian Bible. Uh, chapter 20, verses 1 through 17 also show up in the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, fifth book of the Bible, chapter 5, verses 6 through 21, a set of biblical principles relating to ethics and worship. Play a pretty fundamental role in Judaism and Christianity. Uh, many of these, uh, actually most of these laws uh, show up in the Islamic faith as well. At the point in the Old Testament where they come up, God has chosen Moses to deliver his people from the bondage of slavery in Egypt by parting the Red Sea so the Israelites, God's chosen people in Judeo-Christian tradition uh, could cross to freedom. And the Lord said unto Moses, come unto me into the mount and be there. And I will give thee tablets of stone and a law and commandments which I have written that thou mayest teach them. And Moses rose up and his minister Joshua and Moses went up into the Mount of God. Uh, Moses then led them to Mount Sinai where God gave Moses the 10 commandments as well as the other laws for living the right way. The 10 commandments never actually referred to as 10 commandments uh, are as follows. Thou shalt not, or thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images, meaning no false idols. A lot of Protestant Christians don't think Catholic Christians follow this one too well. What's with all the statues and stained glass images? Idolaters. Uh, the third, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. But remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. The fifth, honor thy father and mother. The sixth, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. The ninth, thou shalt not bear false witness. 10, thou shalt not, uh, you know, uh, rape Ronnie Joe back and risk his life by penetrating his fragile Patty LaBelle dandelion puff puddle. Sorry, throwback to uh, two weeks ago there. No, I should have said, thou shalt not covet. 
thinking of a few weeks back. God, maybe should have added, uh, uh, don't fucking diddle the littles either. You're like, that one's more important to follow than coveting or honoring thy father and mother, especially if one of the parents is doing the diddling. According to a passage in the first book of Kings, the tablets that bore the Ten Commandments were ultimately placed in the Ark of the Covenant. Scholars disagree about uh, when the Ten Commandments were written and by whom, with some modern scholars suggesting that they were uh, modeled on Hittite and Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian laws and treaties. Basically, they're the fundamentals of ethics on top of which you can build a society. Uh, like we said, the Ten Commandments concern matters of fundamental importance uh, in Judaism and Christianity. A list of greatest hits of ethical living, right? The greatest obligation to worship only God. The greatest injury to a person, murder. The greatest injury to family bonds, adultery. The greatest injury to commerce and law, bearing false witness. The greatest intergenerational obligation, honor your parents. The greatest obligation to community, truthfulness. The greatest injury to movable property, theft. They'd also be repeated in the New Testament during Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, according to the book of Matthew, right? Chapter 19, verses 16 through 19. And behold, one came and said unto him, good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, which Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Uh, this would have particular relevance for most Christian sects, including Roman Catholicism, what the movement grew out of. In Catholicism, Jesus freed Christians from the rest of Jewish religious laws, such as their purity or purity and dietary rituals, but not from their obligation to keep the Ten Commandments. According to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the official exposition of the Catholic Church's beliefs, the commandments are considered essential for spiritual good health and growth and serve as the basis of social justice. But rules like the Ten Commandments are not just for Catholics, right? Almost every religion has a set of foundational rules. Like the Quran's three verses of the uh, Surah Anam, which states, among other things, to honor your parents, to not kill your children for fear of poverty. That's sad that that one had to be fucking put in a book. Hey, when you get the uh, time, get tough. Please don't kill the kids. Uh, not to take a life except justly, not to come near the property of the orphan except to enhance it and to follow God's path and not any other among other rules. The movement cult would take these basic societal principles uh, to a whole new level. Since most of the group's members, right, originally Roman Catholic, they already had a firm understanding of the commandments. But since the Catholic Church is highly centralized and has a clear authority structure, how were these leaders of this new movement cult supposed to gain their own power? Well, they did it by convincing group members that the Catholic Church was the enemy, while also publicly still claiming to follow the Pope uh, to avoid suspicion from authorities. Initially, they claimed that instead of coming uh, from a sinful person like the Pope or Cardinals, the group's rules came directly from the Virgin Mary, channeled via Credonia Muende. Don't trust the Pope. Trust the Virgin Mary. I mean, Credonia. She's kind of the Virgin Mary's oracle. Their emphasis on the commandments was so strong that the group discouraged talking for fear of breaking the ninth commandment. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Don't fucking risk it. Here's where shit gets good and weird and very funny now to me, at least to me, Sachs. Usually this commandment interpreted uh, is interpreted as lying, but this group took it so far <laughs> that any kind of speech could be considered bearing false witness. How did they arrive at that? Who the fuck knows? Probably through a bunch of confusing, super long, word salad heavy sermons where eventually no one knew what the hell anyone was talking about. And when the leader said that any kind of talking was bearing false witness, there was probably a collective shoulder shrug, you know, sentiment of like, okay, I, I, I guess that makes sense. And you know God does not want you to lie, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no lying. Of course. And you know God does not want you to spread rumors about your neighbors, right? But yeah, totally, 100%. God hates that. And you know God does not want you to spread rumors about anyone or tell any lies, right? Yeah, yeah. No, that, that tracks. Neighbors, uh, probably just a term for other people in general. No, I, I buy that. And you know that language can be interpreted as being a social construct, one that allows for other social constructs to be created, just ideas that have been imagined up and accepted by people and therefore are subjective. And what one person may consider a lie might not be what another person considers to be a lie, like a lie of omission, which leads us into waters of moral relativism, especially considering rumors. 
Truth is in the eye of the beholder. False memory syndrome is a real thing. Group hypnosis is a real thing, as are hallucinations. So really, you could think you see something happen, and it does happen in your mind's eye, but it does not happen in the eyes of the minds around you, the nature of reality, so fragile in many ways. I mean, what even is reality? What is real? Why risk damnation over something subjective? Why not embrace salvation fully by keeping your mouth totally closed and any possible half-truths hidden forever, right? I mean, right? Uh, um, wow. Uh, kind of just, uh, kind of blew my mind there. Not even sure I should verbally answer. I'm, I'm afraid of bearing false witness now. So, shit. Did I just do it? Did I just lie? What is a lie? I'm scared. I think, what is scared? I'm gonna be quiet now. Where it's safe. Or something like that. Maybe not that detailed. Uh, on some days, communication was only conducted in sign language. Uh, fasts were conducted regularly. Only one meal was eaten on Fridays and Mondays. Sex was forbidden, as was soap. Why soap? Uh, that answer also doesn't seem to be given in sources. I'm going to guess it has something to do with vanity, right? Pride. Maybe quoting verses like Proverbs 31:30, right? Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. You find yourself so charming with your beauty, with your beautiful scent, Harlot, you think your sexy cleanliness will bring you joy? It will certainly not bring you salvation. No more soap. Probably just wanted to save money on soap or some shit. Uh, Movement uh, would also turn to another fringe religious element, the coming apocalypse. Of course, when so many of these cults get doom and gloom, they seem to inevitably reach a point of the world is ending soon. Even the new age ones. It doesn't have to be Abrahamic religions or anything, right? The age of Aquarius is almost upon us. Rejoice. Those of you who, you know, are not killed to make way for a new and better world. Stick with me if you want to be part of the in-group. The cult taught that to avoid damnation in the apocalypse, one had to strictly follow the commandments as they interpreted them. (laughs) And uh, holy shit, do they interpret them weirdly, right? Stay close or perish. Cult, cult, cult. In the 1990s, they strongly emphasized an apocalyptic focus in their uh, smash hit booklet. A timely message from heaven, the end of the present time. This book is an unintentional comedy classic. Quotes from this book are my favorite, I think. There's some vision stuff that's also my favorite. Well, no, the visions are in the book. You know, it is. It is. It's my favorite from this episode. Uh, in the book, the group predicted several dates for the end of the world before finally, finally landed on the year 2000. Right, the third edition of the handbook, mainly written by uh, Dominic uh, Katari Babu, that excommunicated priest who studied in El Segundo, California, uh, proclaimed, all of you living on the planet, listen to what I'm going to say. When the year 2000 is completed, the year that will follow will not be year 2001. The year that will follow shall be called year one in a generation that will follow the present generation. The generation that will follow will have few or many people, depending on who will repent. The Lord told me that hurricanes of fire would rain forth from heaven and spread over all those who would not have repented. These doomsday guys, right? For all the Bible verse quoting they do, they never seem to focus on chapter 24 of the book of Matthew. As Jesus, uh, you know, uh, sits upon the Mount of Olives, his disciples come to him privately saying, uh, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming? As in, when will be the second coming in the end times? Uh, when will they begin? And eventually in verse 36, Jesus says, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the son, but the father only. To me, that verse is is a direct warning to not be a doomsday prick, right? Don't worry about the end. Just fucking have a good life. Shut the fuck up about the end. Uh, New cult members were not required to study the Bible, but were required, of course, to study a timely message from heaven, the end of the present time, and be trained in his text, reading it so many times they'd have to practically memorize it. And of course, the group instilled a number of cult rules. The handbook would explain it uh, this way. Ours is not a religion, but a movement, Mm -hmm. hence the name, that endeavors to make the people aware of the fact that the commandments of God have been abandoned and it gives what should be done for their observance. How were these tenets abandoned? Well, for one, according to them in modern society, girls prefer, (laughs) sorry, girls prefer wearing men's trousers to wearing their own dresses. And you know what? I got to say, they hit the nail on the head (laughs) with that one. I mean, right? Seeing women in men's trousers, whoo, man, does that grind my gears. It's not right. Sometimes the pants are so fucking tight. I can see the outline of their labias. And I'm like, thanks, random lady. Thanks for the painful boner. 
I was going to get a lot of work done today, but now I guess I'm going to go have to pump the sin out of my nuts. What's this world coming to? First women in pants, then women probably just running around naked, and bouncing their sex chests, rubbing their wet puss holes all over everyone, trying to trick us righteous guys, uh, straight dudes into boning our way into Satan's hollow earth fire caves. JK, of course. Uh, the first three chapters of the Colts Handbook in particular, approximately a quarter of the book, of this fucking classic. I'm, I'm surprised Penguin Classics hasn't uh, republished it. Uh, described uh, Mwende's, uh, Kibuteri's, and uh, Kumohangi's as celestial visions. Three of them are having visions. Mostly Mwende. Outlining in obsessive detail the ways in which humanity have been tempted away from the Ten Commandments by Satan. Fucking <laughs> Satan! Learn us away from the path to heaven with his, of course, hypnotic calliope siren call. <laughs> Ladies and pants, some barren false witnesses. That's just two of them anyways. I'm gonna get your soul and have my demons mash on it for all of the days. <laughs> no. Uh, for real now. I don't know why that's so fun for me to do. Uh, these chapters included some of the punishments that await those who continue in their evil habits. AIDS, for example, depicted as a punishment from God for the breaking of the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. Mm-hmm. Makes a lot of sense. You kill somebody, you get AIDS. Anyone who's anyone knows that. Obviously, everyone who kills anyone gets fucking AIDS. That's health class 101. Every serial killer in prison right now dying of uh, so many cases of AIDS. Gary Ridgway, Green River Gary, uh, he of the cleanest ween. Holy fuck, does he have a lot of AIDS. His AIDS have AIDS. Uh, in the book, at the end of uh, recounting her 1989 vision, Merwinde relates a vision of hell. Oh, this is some good stuff. In which she says... <laughs> The people who are in hell are crying. They are burning, but they cannot get to ashes. Instead, they remain alive, but with unimaginable misery and agony. You find in hell people of all colors, of all races, languages, the small and the great, the learned and the unlearned, short and tall, the rich and the poor, people with high social standing, everyone who failed to observe the commandments in this place. The hellfire does not discriminate between persons. I like how thorough she is here. Short, and tall people. Not sure why she felt it compelled to add those particular qualifiers. Like, did she think if she didn't add those, some short, you know, cold member would be like, huh, I'm fucking good. <laughs> this is the tallest center that are going to get burned. <laughs> I'm safe. I mean, I'm, I'm fucking 4'8". There's no way I'm burning. Uh, if the world didn't change its ways, the book warned there would be something called the period of chastisement. And then the subsequent three days of darkness. During this time, it is claimed there will be great tribulation. Actually, I want to do the movie voice for this. There will be great tribulation upon all the people, such that has never before been experienced by any person since the creation of the world. Oh, shit. Would the period of chastisement be worse than constantly burning, but never burning up fully? Always being at the worst stage of burning? No. Uh, not quite that bad, but pretty, pretty sure that's the worst, but still bad. The book predicted that the uh, world would be racked by various natural disasters, such as heavy hailstones. Mm, not really that big of a deal. Hurricanes of fire. Okay, that would fucking suck. Snow. Okay, that's that's normal, actually. Tornadoes. Also normal. Lightning, floods, storms, earthquakes, whirlwinds, and disturbances of the soil. Ah! Okay, I feel like she should have uh, put more time into ratcheting up the action with the weather other than hurricanes. I mean, you can't fucking mention fire hurricanes early as part of the worst times the world has ever seen and then next jump to just snow <laughs> she did say uh rivers and lakes would turn to blood turn to poison or simply dry up that's pretty crazy but still not fire hurricane level crazy uh while clouds will fall from their position and hit the people some will die those who survive will remain miserable that one's just fucking dumb it sounds like she doesn't know what uh, clouds are <laughs> i'll take a cloud hit you can, you can throw clouds at me all day. I don't give a fuck. All right, if I was in a fight with someone and they threw a cloud at me, I would be first off impressed that they were magical. But then if that's all they could do, I would just laugh. I'd be like, dude, what are you doing? It doesn't hurt at all. It's kind of fun, dumb shit. Who throws clouds in a fight? Uh, she added that women would give birth to animals and animals would give birth to human beings. It's creepy, but maybe kind of cool. I mean, what if you had a really cute puppy? Or what if you had a cool tiger for a mom? Uh, she said that there would be various fatal accidents involving cars and airplanes. I mean, that, that already happens quite a bit. As well as general civil disorder. I mean, that was already happening in Uganda. Uh, with religious denominations and nations fighting amongst each other. I mean, that's happened a lot over the course of history already. 
and families fighting amongst themselves also happens a lot. Uh, her vision also predicted that the world would see an endless famine with crops being destroyed by poisonous locusts. I mean, that does suck. Still waiting for something to be worse than flaming hurricanes, though. She said uh, cattle would be either destroyed by adverse weather conditions or stricken with incurable diseases. Meat from slaughtered cattle would be poisonous. Cows will uh, either not give milk or give milk that's undrinkable. Other foods, uh, some other foods, especially alcoholic drinks, <laughs> yeah, would turn to poison. No, oh, that's annoying. But we can't live without cow uh, milk, cheese, beef, you know, beer. Not going to be as fun. Not going to be as fun. But we got chicken. Uh, oat milk is pretty creamy and tasty. Uh, cheese from goat milk is delicious. Uh, and then her vision started to mention specific countries. <laughs> the disparity between what country gets what is hilarious to me. Mozambique will be destroyed by its own machinery. Japan will have rain falling. For as long as father wants. What? Sounds like Japan getting off fucking way easier than Mozambique. Mozambique is going to be beset by some kind of Skynet Terminator situation. And Japan (laughs) is going to be pretty wet. Uh, There was actually a well-written out list for several countries. I'll share just some of my favorites. It's tedious to go through all of them. There's so many. Russia will have the pest of locusts of various types. Uh, Zambia will be attacked by diseases of seven various types will, will, which will not have any cure. Some of the places in Kenya will dry up. <laughs> uh, Zambia uh, getting rocked by seven incurable diseases. Kenya will be really dry in some places. Uh, Rwanda, 100,000 ghosts will be released to Rwanda to join with those already in the country. Fucking what? I'm not sure what's going on there. Uh... Tanzania will experience all the dust of unbelief from other countries. Uh, Double what? London. (laughs) Your desire for doing evil will be fulfilled in all ways. Uh, That sounds like, I don't know, it might be fun for some people there. Asia will be punished for its pride in trying to excel the Holy Spirit with the knowledge which the Holy Spirit gave her. Fucking what? And is Japan getting that and the rain? Damascus, the water from your rivers will turn to ice. All right, so they wear coats now and go ice skating. Libya will experience 17 various attacks at the same time. That's an odd-ass number of attacks. Is 17 supposed to be scarier than 10 or 20? (laughs) This this might be my favorite. Holland. (laughs) Flies of various types will break out in your midst. (laughs) <laughs> Zambia getting motherfucked with disease and Holland has quite a few flies to deal with. Uh, <laughs> Francis says, uh, your laziness will not permit you to endure the chastisements that will be inflicted upon you until you are destroyed in lamentation. Okay. All right. France get destroyed. Mexico, heavy arms that are going to destroy five countries will be transported through your roads. All right. So Mexico actually not getting punished. Weapons to punish other places passing through Mexico. Uh, Mexico sound like a great place to kind of uh, ride all this shit out in, right? Have some drinks on the beach, watch the arms, just pass on by. Uh, the result of all of this would be, according to Credonia, cannibalism naturally, right? All right, the strong eating the weak, parents eating their own offspring or offspring of others. Seems like an extreme reaction to a lot of rain in Japan, but it's all cannibalism now, all around the world. And uh, still not done. Oh, not even close. Uh, Mexico sounding less appealing, by the way, if everybody's eating each other there. But also, you guys, there are fucking demons of some kind all over the place. And there are, quote, fierce animals and, quote, frightening beings that are partly man and partly animal. Wandering the earth, hunting for the person who has not got the Ten Commandments. Holy shit. Not sure the rain in Japan is uh, even necessary to uh, have been mentioned now. Pretty sure no one gives a fuck about rain if there's rampant cannibalism and chimeras hunting people. Domestic animals, which are already possessed by the devil, will now develop (laughs) poison so they can kill their owners. Oh, no, not poison pets. Still not done. Devils will also emerge from the underworld to harass people and work signs and wonders so that the people will not have the Ten Commandments. And will accept and will accept the signs as coming from God. Oh, tricky devils! Really confused more than ever by the rain mention now, right? Who in Japan is focused on fucking rain with all this other shit going on? 
Right? Who's like, oh, no, can't believe another fire hurricane hit us in the middle of all this rain. Sure, it'd be a lot easier to spot the demons and cannibals and monsters hunting us and devils harassing us and poisonous pets and shit if it wasn't so rainy. At the end of this period of chastisement, uh, fucking finally, the book claimed, several signs will appear to mark the end of this generation. As if all that other stuff wasn't enough. First, a huge bird of prey with claws similar to those of an eagle and a crest on its head, which was similar to that of a cock, <laughs> would rise to a position where the whole world can see it. That's a big-ass bird, A. And B, you have to have a flat earth for this to make sense, right? For everyone to see at the same time. So these dipshits, also flat earthers, of course they are, on top of everything else. Next, a large crucifix would appear that would make all the earth tremble, all right? Finally, a sound like that of a trumpet or a bugle uh, resounding like the sound of a bell will be heard, followed by a period of silence across the world until three holy ones of God appear to command that those of you who have been redeemed, go take up your places, what happens if you're not redeemed, but you have somehow lived through all the other shit? Do you try and sneak to wherever you think is uh, the right place now? Like risk some holy one yelling at you, hey, not you, Cummins. Fuck. Can't believe the chimeras or cannibals didn't already get you. Or even demons or devils. What kind of lazy low rent monsters did we put to work down here? Get out of here. Anywhere but here. And also not Mexico. We fucked up on Mexico. We made it too easy to live there. Larry was supposed to do that, but got distracted with his stupid Japanese rain idea. Then after all this shit, <laughs> there are still the three days of darkness, during which time those who have repented will go into buildings, referred to as arcs or ships, to kind of wait things out. She said, uh, they were ordered to shut all the doors and not open anything at all. All activities, such as eating, praying, should take place inside, or should take place inside, for three days. Anything that remained outside in the dark turned into devils. These devils lamented and cried for three days, after which they were thrown into hell. <laughs> like more Michael Bay explosions. Uh, once this period was over, death in the underworld would be vanquished and Satan, having been put in fetters, would no longer be able to tempt the redeemed uh, who will be given new knowledge, new bodies, new material things that will be very beautiful. This new earth will be connected with heaven and there would be uh, a bunch of people coming to visit the earth from heaven. Uh, Uganda would become the new Israel, the second Israel, of course, uh, which will in turn convert all other nations. But only about a quarter of the population is going to survive to see this. Indeed, Credonia Merwende warned how those going to heaven will be few. But a quarter of the population doesn't sound like few. It sounds like a lot of people feel like you could take your chances outside the cult. Maybe still sneak in. Cult members didn't think that, though. Groups members lived in fear. Led strict, joyless lives. Most of them living on pineapple and banana plantations that the cult owned. This land, uh, you know, was bought by pooling the profits from the property of the members who had to sell uh, their property and give their uh, earnings uh, or actually, you know, give their deeds, you know, land deeds to the movement. Cult, cult, cult. Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays at the cults are days of fasting beginning at 3 a.m. with prayers called the way of the cross. Fun. Three days of fasting every week. Got to keep people hungry and confused. Great way to keep them controlled in a cult, as we learned before. At 5 a.m., members would be allowed to sleep, uh, rising again at 7 a.m. to go work until 1 p.m., Sleep, deprivation, and hunger. Classic cult life combo. Uh, members would be, uh, then attend another prayer session that would last for an hour, after which they'd be given uh, a one-hour free time, which I would imagine they would use to fucking sleep again. Following that, they'd return to work until supper at 8 p.m. Their day would then end with night prayers from 11 p.m. until midnight. Members also prohibited from wearing ordinary clothes are instead required to wear robes. Sweet which through their respective colors serve to designate their positions within the movement, right? Neophytes, newbies, for example, would wear black, while green would be worn by those who had seen the commandments. Green and white, the color for those ready to die in the ark. It really sucked to give these assholes all your shit, right? You pray and pray, you get very little sleep or food, you know, for months, and you're still stuck in a black robe. Oh, just come on! Why can't I get into the ark? Members of all degrees uh, also wore three rosaries, two around their neck, facing forwards and backwards, a third carried in the hand. On special occasions, they could sneak a fourth under their skivvies. I don't know why. Credonia is the conduit for the Virgin Mary, generally told the group what to do and how to do it. The members, the longer the cult had been around, became more and more bonded to her, hanging on the details of the various visions she said she'd receive. At the same time, Credonia inspired fear amongst the mem movement's members. She took over the whole running of the movement, demoting and punishing those who were considered, uh, uh, you know, uh, not following the, the leaders or fellow leaders not following her could be punished. Excuse me. Sooner or later, all commands came from visions channeled through Cadonia. 
And how did she receive these visions? Well, from <laughs> a phone, of course. Kind of. She claimed to receive messages from the Virgin Mary through a hidden telephone system <laughs> that would communicate to her through everyday objects. <laughs> that sounds legit. That sounds reasonable. <laughs> right? <laughs> like God, God has the power to destroy the world whenever God wants, but it has to create this weird imaginary telephone system to be able to talk to people. Okay. Uh, based on her visions, the group developed elaborate hierarchies with Credoni, of course, at the top. Under her, former priests who served as theologians, as I said before, explained the messages behind the visions uh, and then regular people at the bottom. But even though they weren't in charge, the average member still had a lot of responsibility, specifically when it came to recruitment and recruiting. Members would write letters potential re- to potential recruits to introduce the idea of joining the group. Uh, sometimes they'd get back an invitation to visit and members would go to the home and spend a few days or weeks spending the uh, spreading the messages and attending to the family. The families visited were chosen on their basis of being probable candidates, either because someone in the family had succumbed to HIV slash AIDS, or there had been a misfortune of similar proportions. Before the family members would be accepted into the movement, they would have to pay a fee to the leadership and then move into any available group properties to be taught the ways of the group. Those who eventually joined uh, strongly encouraged to convince members of their families and friends to also join. Majority of those who joined are women and their children. As part of their spiritual transformation and preparation for their meeting with a panel of leaders, each new member was given an exercise book in which to list all the personal and intimate sins he or she had committed since birth. Once the leadership reviewed this sin list, they came up with a sum of money that the person could pay as compensation for their sins. And that amount seemed to line up with maybe a little bit more than the sum total of everything you owned. Gridonia would then be asked to plead with the Virgin to forgive the sins. In return, the movement took care of its members by redistributing the wealth, kind of, but not really. People were given a place to stay, but never had enough food to eat, uh, you know, uh, never got, got enough sleep. All this, of course, makes them sound like, you know, a cult, especially considering uh, what would happen to the members in 2000. How'd they get away with this for so long? Because Uganda was dealing with a lot of other shit, as we talked about. And by appearing outwardly as just another Catholic offshoot sex, a sect amongst many in Africa. And they did appear to be, well, uh, you know, pretty Catholic at quick glance. They still recognized the Pope was legitimate and head of the church, kind of, but not really because Credoni was their leader, but outwardly. Uh, Mass was still celebrated in a way similar to other Roman Catholic churches in Uganda. At one time or another, several of the leaders and key members, most notably Dominic uh, Catarobabo, were priests, even if excommunicated priests kicked out when the Catholic establishment found out what they were doing, but members didn't always know they were kicked out. Okay. With that big overview complete, now let's dig into their story chronologically. We're actually more than halfway through the episode. Uh, we'll fill in some story details we missed and dig into the true horror of how all this ended in today's time stuck timeline for the movement of the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. Allegedly, Credonia has her first vision, right? The Virgin Mary, March 10th, 1981. Virgin Mary supposedly tells her to repent, renounce her sins. Like we mentioned up top in the spring of 1984, April 25th, Joseph Kibuteri claims to also get a message from Virgin Mary and from Jesus. Even cooler to hear from Jesus back when every Tom, Dick, and Mary in this part of Africa are getting messages from Mary. Uh, They allegedly instruct him to repent, completely reject his sins, pray more, and mortify himself. All right? Kibateri did so, he was informed that he could be sent to his neighbors to teach them to restore the Ten Commandments of the Lord God, which they have abandoned. In a weird coincidence, or maybe they made this shit up after the fact, a couple days later, Credonia, her sister, Angelina Migisha, reports a very similar vision. So many visions. Credonia and Joseph would not meet for years at this point. Also in the spring of 1984, Angelina reports seeing an apparition in which the Virgin informs her that she had been chosen to be a model for the nation of Uganda in restoring the Ten Commandments. Magisha also claimed that Jesus had informed her that he and his mother had selected 12 apostles whose mandate and vocation it was to bring people back to the Ten Commandments. Not sure what happens to Magisha later in the the story. She just kind of disappears in sources. Uh, June of 1989, Fredonia claims that she has received instructions from God to spread the Virgin Mary's message of repentance and faith. Some people think that Fredonia killed uh, her sister. Uh, So right now they got a little sister, sister, uh, sister, sister vision off. Intense spiritual sibling rivalry. A few weeks later, Magisha's daughter, Ursula Kumanagi, Credonia's niece, says she also has had an identical message in her vision. Everyone's getting visions. Instructing her to spread the message amongst all categories of people, but especially to fellow youths. 
God, you feel like shit if you're in this family and not getting any visions. Uh, according to Ursula's vision, which supposedly occurred June 25th, 1989, these youths were especially guilty of abandoning the fourth, fifth, and sixth commandments. They're not honoring the Sabbath, not honoring their parents, and, you know, fucking murdering people. Ha! <laughs> Kids these days. Uh, Credoni and Ursula start preaching together. Immediately after that, they visit uh, Mabuye, where a girl from that Catholic school in Rwanda, uh, you know, uh, where that outbreak uh, of visions had been, where she had moved to. Or they visited her first, then made up the backstory I just went over after hearing her story. Just kind of copy parts of it. Also that June, Credonia meets Joseph Kibuteri. Soon the movement is born. The, the, they would first be based in Kibuteri's home where he was living with his wife, and as I mentioned, 16 kids. After the group was formally created, 12 apostles chosen for the new community. Six of them women in connection with the movement's strong uh, connection to Virgin Mary. According to the group's literature, Jesus gave the reason for this arrangement. Namely, that at the beginning of his first mission to redeem mankind, he chose from his disciples 12 men, whom he called apostles, because he was alone. But now he says that at his second coming, uh, he has come with his mom. And since she's the one who asked God, the father, for this mission, it's appropriate that she gets people of, you know, her kind on the, on the team of the apostles of this new community, you know, second generation, yada, yada. Lisa's cult is pro-woman, right? A little silver lining in all their doomsday madness and overall exploitation of members. Uh, then taking it a step further, the movement will try and take over other small Catholic sects in the area that have a strong focus on the Virgin Mary. Nice! Cult cannibalizing other cults. Credoni and her visions were able to attract a number of followers, in some accounts, up to 200 people, including, like we mentioned, several local priests, uh, like Father Dominic uh, Katari Babo, the priest who had been educated in Loyola Marymount University. He had become the chief author of the group's literature, right? We went over some of it. Already writing more passages like, I was shown a country where the whole land got too dry to the extent of leaving behind nothing drinkable and nothing that could be eaten. I saw people running here and there looking for something to eat. In the end, they started eating one another. That's the cannibal shit I was talking about. Then I heard a voice speaking from heaven saying, this is the end of sin. It is the closing of this generation and it is time to punish those who are disobedient and do not repent. He also wrote, you know, God further says that domestic animals such as cats and dogs are already possessed by the devil. Mm -hmm. Right, they're poisonous. We talked about that. From these animals, Satan is actually fighting against men, particularly those, particularly those who can own these animals. Yeah, fucking pets possessed by the devil. Got to keep a closer eye on the doodles. Penny Pooper and Ginger Bell. Penny and Dee Dee, thinking this whole time they were just sweet little babies, right? Maybe sometimes be you know beggars and bed hoggers, but uh, no, they're they're demonically possessed which does at least explain Didi's farts. He also wrote, the Lord showed me one big animal. It was as big as a mountain in a vision. It was ordered to eat the people and took as many as can be found in one whole country. Among the small animals, I could see some which were as big as a bus, some others which were as big as a huge house, while others were as big as a cow or a goat, some as big as a, a chicken, respectively. I feel like they needed an editor. <laughs> right, so he saw some mammoth giant animals, but then also saw other animals that were the size of, you know, animals that you, you already see. Some of his passages, so unintentionally funny. I saw big snakes biting the legs of the people and the legs fell down. The largest snake was 10 times the size of the tire of a lorry, like a little, you know, tra you know like a cargo truck. The snakes are of various sizes. The sight of their skin is scary. I could see that even the ordinary ones had been given more poison content. Oh no, big scary skin snakes with extra poison content. <laughs> this is their head writer. <laughs> the cult would claim that they've been receiving this info for as far, as far back as 1978. No, not true. They just made up a backstory to sound cooler. According to supposedly much older revelations, Satan will bring commodities and give them out free of charge. And those who will refuse them will be persecuted. There will be a lot of evil that is going to be perp uh, perpetrated using people, just as the Lord is acting through people these times. There's going to be a lot of suffering. The people who will not have the number 666 will not be, not be allowed to buy or sell commodities. Sound at the start of that, like Satan's uh, like one of those people giving away free uh, snack samples at Costco. Fucking watch out for Costco lady. Uh, they would even predict that when the devil came up to earth, devils, they would grab cars from drivers and will drive the cars. Some will drive these cars into the bush and in the mountains. Oh no, Satan's carjackers. Damn you devil. Please do not drive my car into the bush. Some of the predictions would be like the Japanese rain, incredibly mundane. <laughs> this is my favorite mundane one. Misunderstandings will develop amongst the people working in the same institutions. 
those working in lower positions will try to get higher positions. God, that one fucking kills me. <laughs> what a weird thing to mix in. And there will be a great pestilence that will befall the land. And the rivers will run with blood. Hurricanes of fire will burn many. Half-human hunters will massacre sinners. Man eating fellow man. Mothers eating children. Demons and devils will torment and destroy the living. Insects and famine and drought and disease and torment will bring the kingdoms of man to their knees. And also, there will be a lot of, uh, misunderstandings. <laughs> yes, people will mishear each other in various offices and other places of work. Greatly reducing productivity in moments that lead to a lot of confusion and sometimes hurt feelings and bruised egos. And also, those working in the most menial positions will now want to be promoted and maybe get better positions with more pay, benefits, and extra days of paid leave, which will throw off the natural order of expectations and whatnot. Ha ha ha, that is what Satan has in store for Fucking ridiculous. Just mixing the worst shit ever with just, you know, messages of just fucking banal day-to-day -day life. Former Roman Catholic priest Paul Ikazire, uh, <laughs> right, the rare former member who, who would outlive the cult, uh, joins up sometime in 18, 1989, as we talked about. Apparently, Paul had a vision around 81 or 82 which told him to stop letting parishioners come up and touch the communion wafers with dirty hands. Like moms who have been doing, uh, you know, so after changing their kids' diapers, uh, women who had touched menstrual blood. Who's fucking doing that at church? <laughs> and men who touched urine. Is that a problem? Was that a problem at the church? Um, and also, did he have a vision or just kind of a practical idea to help not spread disease? You know, at his church, before the church kicked him out, he changed the way people received communion uh, in not rational ways. Dude, this guy, to me, blatantly mentally ill. Started making sure that uh, three people would walk up to the altar at a time, followed by three more people. Uh, all of the groups of three had to leave at the exact same time. Okay, so mentally ill Paul, after he joins, uh, Credonia starts to uh, have more visions, lots of visions. Maybe she felt threatened by Paul's visions. Maybe she felt threatened, you know, working uh, with other people. Also having so many out visions, had to out vision them. According to descriptions from Kibuteri's family later, Credonia uh, started claiming to receive messages from the Virgin uh, via now the invisible telephones uh, hidden in, you know, plates and cups and shit. <laughs> the messages would tell her stuff like uh, Kibuteri should take his kids out of school or sell various possessions to feed those living within his household. Then the messages started to get kind of dark and violent. According to one of Kibuteri's daughters, Edith, Credonia uh, announced on one occasion that the Virgin Mary told her a sacrifice was needed and all of the Kibuteri kids under five needed to be killed. Mother Mary out for fucking blood now. Feels totally off for who she was uh, prior in the story, right? She was the one working to have God not kill us. Uh, now she wants to kill some kids. Luckily, that didn't happen. Not sure how she kept credibility and leadership after one of her visions is uh, kind of sh shot down. It's almost like none of these people are logical or rational. Well, no kids were sacrificed, not yet. Uh, Credonia did beat followers and mistreat Joseph's family members, for example, uh, by denying them food and medical attention, claiming all the while that she was merely following instructions of the Virgin Mary, Fucking new, there's a new sheriff in town, new Mary. She's on the dark side. She hates it when kids go to the doctor now or have full bellies. One of Joseph's sons would remember when the people came here, they started mistreating us, the family members, the children and the mother, saying the Virgin Mary had told them to do things, to keep us without food and to punish us. Despite a lot of early red flags, right? The cult would grow. Uh, not sure how, but they, you know, the cults again, it doesn't have to be reasonable, rational. 1992, the first day predicted by the movement as the end of the world. Of course, doesn't happen. Whoops. Uh, it is now predicted to occur in 1995. Love when these assholes predict the end of the world. It doesn't happen. And they keep a bunch of members or even grow, you know, get more successful. Looking at you, Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, once you got members believing the world is ending when they're uh, down to ride out the final days with you, it takes a lot to get rid of them. After that failed prediction, some followers have had enough. One of Kiba Terry's sons uh, leads a drive to force the movement from the family property. After suffering years of abuse, including Credonia's attempt, you know, to kill all the kids under five. The movement now uh, numbered around 250 people and they are forced out. Good for that. Uh, good for that kid. Colt now settles on a piece of land near Credonia's hometown of uh, Kununga. 
that had been left to her by a father after his death the previous year. Some sources say that she was able to get this land by killing all of her siblings uh, or having them killed by others. Here at what they called, when translated, Rescue Place for the Virgin Mary, the movement builds a true cult compound comprising a house for the leaders, separate dorms for male and female members, right? No one gets to have sex. Da, 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 da. Boarding school, two guest houses, kitchen stores, a shrine, a cemetery, a poultry project, and a dairy farm with 30 cows. All this funded by money taken from new members. Also attempt to establish several other campuses in other towns. The movement recruits new followers from nearby districts as far away as the capital of Kampala. There were also centers for evang uh, evangelization in several other cities. 1994, the group suffers a setback when former priest Paul Ikazir leaves the sect, taking with him approximately 70 members. There had been a leadership debate. Those who thought Paul should be in charge left. Who's leading those who remained? Joseph Kiboteri, theoretically in charge at the very start. He had bankrolled, housed the group for many years, but he was weak. Also, poor, uh, you know, do feel bad from here. Uh, you know, mentally ill, suffered from extreme manic depression. Credonia is now really running the show. If she wasn't already, probably already it was, now definitely for sure. She translates her visions from the Virgin Mary into the rules, the program, as cult members referred to them. As we said up top, much of the program published in a red book called A Timely Message from Heaven, The End of the Present Times. Uh, she would also take to discipline members, uh, do that, you know, uh, she was head of discipline. If you broke a rule, she'd give it, she'd give you, she had given you, man, my God, she'd say that you had been cursed by the Virgin Mary and Jesus. However, neither she nor the other members lived that much differently from ordinary members. They weren't living in luxury, all the rest toiled in squalor. So that's rare for a cult leader. Uh, this all might've been less about getting a bunch of people, uh, you know, to, uh, for a bunch of money and more about really delusional people actually thinking God put them in charge of saving humanity from the apocalypse. 1995, right? The year that the uh, leaders had predicted was going to bring about the end of the world again. Of course, the end doesn't happen. Second prediction fails. Membership down a bit, but not by much, but then they'll grow even bigger than ever in the coming years. You would think that fucking up back-to-back -back doomsday predictions would spell, you know, doom for a doomsday cult, but no. Keeping members continually sleep deprived, overworked, hungry, confused, uh, had to help them overlook all this. And, you know, they'd given all their property and, and stuff to the cult. So they're pretty pot committed. By the late 90s, the church had grown into a thriving community. Uh, using the word thriving loosely there. By 1997, according to a filing with the government, the movement's membership listed as nearly 5,000 people. Uh, interestingly, rather than be separate from society, like many of the other cults we've covered here, some members of the movement uh, seem to at least nominally be involved in local politics. They voted overwhelmingly for the ruling national resistance movements in both the 1996 presidential and parliamentary elections and the 1997-1998 local council elections. Not sure why they would do this if the world was about to end. Might have been in order to let them squeak by without too much governmental oversight, right? Stay in the government's good graces. According to a later uh, Uganda Human Rights Commission report, the leaders of the movement deliberately kept as close as possible to government officials, especially local leaders. For example, by establishing their camps near police posts, participating in community activities, paying graduated taxes and rent promptly. I bet they also paid a fuck ton of bribes. A lot of bribery going on here that they weren't going to write up in a governmental report. 1998, the Ugandan press reported that the movement had been shut down for unsanitary conditions, use of child labor, and possibly kidnapping children. But for some reason, can't find why in sources, the sect allowed to reopen by the government. And again, I got to think bribes. Partly 1999, at the latest, the group had predicted yet another date for the end of the world. Right. And all the Y2K madness we discussed earlier made it seem more possible than ever. Lots of people worried about the end times. The state owned New Vision newspaper runs an interview with a teenage member of the movement. And he says the world ends next year. There's no time to waste. Some of our leaders talk directly to God. Any minute from now, when the end comes, every believer who will be at an as yet undisclosed spot will be saved. So they added that in there. Right? You got to like, you know, believe in the right things and be at the right spot. Cult, cult, cult. Members becoming more frenzied than ever now. Leaders are convincing them to confess their sins in preparation for the end times. Right? Uh, if uh, they're, they're selling all, a lot of the cult's belongings, fast and cheap, clothes, cattle getting sold for fractions of market value. Any new members have to sell stuff like real fast. Past members recruited, they have to sell any shit they've accumulated. Uh, work in the cult's field starts to cease. In August of 1999, Dementira Shoshano, 61 years old, longstanding cult member, goes to the nearby town of Kabale to collect her oldest daughter and her daughter's seven children. How sad. That December, they gave away their clothes and dressed in the black and green uniforms of the cult, leave for the church in Kananga, along with two other daughters and nine more grandchildren. 
The uh, uh, other family members opposed this. Uh, one uh, father of uh, one group of the kids said he was mildly curious, though, to see if the world was, in fact, going to end. He told reporters after the fact, I was also waiting to see what was going to happen. My mind was open. So even people who are like, nope, I'm not going to your cult are like, yeah, but the world might end. January 1st, 2000 passes, of course, without the apocalypse. Uh, now the movement starts to unravel. Members are fucking pissed. A lot of them have been through three missed you know, end dates. And they're wondering, why the fuck do we sell our things? Why, why, you know, especially like new members are wondering, why do we sell things quickly for dirt cheap when we're not going to go to heaven after all? Gridonia quickly calls a meeting, tells the group that the Virgin Mary actually reappeared just now to her and the other leaders. Now the date for Armageddon, for sure, March 17th. Some people thrilled, some are, some are not. Some members begin to demand that their previous donations get refunded. They're like, they've been conned. They realize it now. Others questioning Credonia's leadership skills. In an attempt to placate dissenters, Credonia promised that the Blessed Virgin Mary will refund the money for the sale of the members' properties. No problem. She asked her priest to record the names of the followers who are not happy. Those who submit complaints are, according to witnesses, called to a meeting with the movement's leaders and never fucking seen again, a.k.a. murdered. Anyone who asked where those individuals had gone were informed that they had just been transferred to another of the group's properties or that the Virgin had taken them to heaven. Sweet. They successfully managed to weed out the dissenters, but now they have only a few months to figure out what to do with everybody else. What happens when the world does not end a fourth time? Now it's time to plan a collective suicide for the faithful. March 17th, because that's the end of the world, March 15th is set aside to be a day for the group's final celebration. Uh, Leaders also put it out there that they're planning a party for the March 18th. Authorities would later believe that date was a calculated misdirection to throw police off their trail. Now they start reaching out to all their members across Uganda trying to get them to come to the big final party. It's mandatory. It's the last hoedown. One nun would go from village to village announcing that the Virgin Mary coming on March 17th. Oh, rejoice. One member quoted as telling a local man that he was leaving to go to uh, Kanunga because our leader received a message from God that on March 17th, we're going to meet Jesus and Mary. The parents of one woman wrote to her uh, saying that they were preparing to go to heaven. Terrifying message to get from family members. And yet another, one member wrote to his wife informing her about the closure of the ark There will be no 2001. He would add, as we follow directives from heaven, we are supposed to gather in the selected area before the wrath of almighty God. The creator is let down on to non-repentance. Keep my words on your hearts. There will never be 2001. Catastrophes will befall humankind and the indicators of such will be wars, crime increase, such as murder, rape, robbery, etc. There will be a lot of fear among the human races. Appearance of strange animals and people will be noticed. I would request you, that if you come across such, simply run and look for me. I will not fail to seek refuge for you. Whoever wanted his brother or family to perish does not stick to property. Simply leave it behind and run for your life. I will always pray for you as I have nothing else I can do. May God guide you. Now, if I ever got a letter like that, obviously I would assume that the sender had lost their fucking mind. But then if I saw a bunch of strange animals after that letter, I'm going to run and try and find that fucker as fast as I can. A cult document from January 15th seems to address local authorities. It would say, uh, and you being the leaders, it is important that you know about the following, whether you may believe it or not. The truth of the matter is that it is not going to change. When the year 2000 comes to an end, the present times or generation will be changed and there will follow a new generation and a new earth. Only those who have the 10 commandments of God will go to live in the new earth. The year 2000 will not be followed by year 2001, but will be followed by year one in a all caps new generation. Gridonia, other high-ranking members. Again, they might have actually believed some of this shit. According to a personal friend of Credonia, on March 11th, she declares to her that we shall soon be going to heaven and you will be hearing about us on radio and reading about us in newspapers. Huh. How would there be newspapers still in print if the end times have come? Wasn't the world supposed to be descending into fire and chaos? Really starting to think that uh, she was truly nuts. And again, like uh, that this was not a grift or at least not totally a grift that maybe she thought she heard shit. Maybe she was mentally ill as well. Really did hear shit. Uh, March 12th, Dominic Katari Babo, the priest who had been educated in the U.S., dresses in black, grabs his rosary, heads to the town of Kasisi to see an electrician named John Musoki, tells John that he has an electrical problem, needs to buy sulfuric acid, normally used in the area to charge car batteries, buys a lot of it, approximately 170 U.S. dollars worth. March 14th, three representatives of the movement spend the entire day at the regional administrative headquarters of the government in order to pay a graduated tax for each member of the community. Authorities would later look at how they pay the members taxes and think this disproves the theory that leaders would flee with the members' money 
after the mass suicide slash murder. But maybe they were just trying to throw the authorities off again. Also left important documents with regional authorities, prominent amongst those uh, documents with some land titles. Why? The police were supposed to make them available to former members. The revelation listed several dozens of them by name. Uh, these members were invited to repent, come to reopen the community, live there, continue to preach the message. Documents stated that the repentant apostates should not refuse to do the work because only a few months would remain to complete it. Do they really believe this shit? March 16th, 2000, the day before the uh, the big finale, a parcel from Kanunga arrives at the home of Mr. Kibuteri's family, Teresa and the 16 kids, contains books and documents from the cult, a certificate of registration, a copy of the Ten Commandments of the cult, and other items. A letter in the package informs the family they should carry on with what we have been doing because we are going to perish. Fucking sad. Uh, that day, Kibuteri deposits the land title of their property along with the uh, movement's articles of association, constitution, and certificate of incorporation with the police at Kananga for safe custody. Then the members gather and pray all through the night. Next day, March 17th, 2000, St. Patrick's Day, Friday, the number one song in the US, Say My Name by Destiny's Child in the UK. It's Pure Shores by All Saints. If you like video games, you were probably playing Dance Dance Revolution or Cyber Groove. But the members of the movement, not listening to Destiny Child, not playing Dance Dance Revolution. Kind of hate to admit it, but I was sometimes playing Dance Dance Revolution because that game was a lot of fun, even though you look like a complete fucking idiot. Scrambling your feet around as fast as you could with your friends. I kind of want to play that game uh, with Lindsay and the kids right now. Too much fun. But no fun being had by cult members. Instead, they're having a massive party at Kanunga where they roast three bulls. They drink 70 crates of soft drinks. Oh, what a party. Meat and soda. Really going all out. The last night on earth, getting high as fuck on sugar and caffeine. A little before 10 in the morning, the members are seen leaving uh, the new church to enter the old church, which was used as a dining hall at the time. According to one former cult member who narrowly escaped, we started it as usual with breakfast, but later we were sprinkled with the blessed water, which had a queer smell from the one they used to sprinkle on us daily. Five cans of the blessed water and 20 liter and 10 liter containers was placed in the corners of the dormitory we were praying from. Each one of us was given a candle and a matchbox. Uh-oh. We kept on singing, waiting for the Mother Mary to come as we were told, but later I went outside to Kananga Trading Center to buy some cakes for the kids who were crying. He would see the windows being closed when he looked back and said, I thought that maybe we were all going to heaven and leaving our building intact and closed. I thought this was the intention of our leaders to leave our building locked as we go to heaven. So I hurried up to buy the cakes and returned. Luckily, he didn't make it back in time. 10.30, there was a huge explosion. The whole church goes up in flames. Interestingly, this former member would say that some of the group's leaders did not die in the fire. He said, Mwende and Kasapuri, another kind of high-ranking member, during daytime left the camp and were replaced by two new leaders. They told us that they were going to prepare another branch for similar prayers. Katari Babu had left in the morning ahead of others. Interesting. Where'd they go? And if they were really killing all their followers and moving on, why did they give that shit to the government earlier? Meanwhile, the fire rages. At 12.45 p.m. local time, uh, police re uh, receive a radio call. The police head to Kanunga. When they arrive, they see a smoldering building. As the flames abate, they discover the remains of hundreds of people, mostly bones, but in some cases, bones full of smoldering flesh. The remains frozen in their final poses of attempting to escape from a burning fucking building. I unintentionally saw video uh, of their remains in a video on YouTube when I was looking for pronunciation, actually. Horror movie shit, but so much worse, obviously, because it's real. These remains piled on one end of the chapel in total over 500 people, estimated approximately 530 killed in this place. And that number included dozens of kids. It's fucking ridiculous. There was no sign of the five principal cult leaders, Joseph Kibuteri, uh, Joseph Casaparari, John, uh, the five leaders at this time, John uh, Kamagara, Dominic Katari Babo, Babo uh, or Credonia Merwende. Authorities assumed that they died in the fire but many think they fled and went into hiding. Uh, and yeah, by Monday, March 19th, the remains had all been buried together in a grave alongside the wrecked house of worship, but there was still more carnage for authorities to uncover. Four days after the fire, March 21st, police make more grisly discoveries. While investigating additional properties that belong to the movement, they discover hundreds of bodies at sites across southern Uganda. Six bodies discovered sealed in the latrine of the Kanunga compound. Man, three had their stomachs slit open. One had a crushed skull. Maybe that was people who wanted their shit back. Dr. Sam Barungi explained, some were beaten, some were burned, some were chemically poisoned. Then their bodies dumped down into the pit. There were also 153 bodies found buried in a compound in another village. Some of them had been stabbed. Others had pieces of cloth wrapped tightly around their throats. 
appeared to have been dead for at least a month. Uh, there were 155 bodies at Dominic Katar- Katari Babu's estate at Ragazi, where they'd been poisoned and stabbed. Another 81 bodies at lay leader Joseph Nir- N- Nimorinda's farm. 44 of those children. Forensics investigators indicated that they'd been murdered weeks before the church inferno. At least one woman was pregnant. Also on March 21st, the Roman Catholic hierarchy distances itself from the tragedy. The country's bishops said that the group's excommunicated leaders had erred and broke the discipline of the church. True. The sex members were misled by obsessed leaders into an obnoxious form of religiosity completely rejected by the Catholic church. Besides the bodies at the church, medical examiners determined that the majority of dead sect members had been poisoned. Early reports suggest that they'd been strangled based on the presence of twisted banana fibers around their necks. Despite some sources listing the death toll at around 1,000, the final death toll settled at 778 in the most reliable sources. After all the bodies had been found, it was still unclear where the leaders were. Katari Babu originally identified among the dead, but later the Ugandan government issued a warrant for his arrest, along with warrants for Kibuteri and Mwende. Dental records for the three are unavailable. It was impossible to determine whether they had died in the fire or not, as their families believe, or escape with the movement's money, as a lot of witnesses believe and suggested. And the Ugandan government would uh, speculate at least. Perhaps they gave the government a lot of land titles and other documents earlier warning to the apocalypse to appear committed to dying, but really also had enough money to start new lives somewhere else themselves. And if that's true, these are some evil fucks to kill all these kids and everybody, all these other innocent people. Uh, President Yoweri uh, Museveni called the event a mass murder by priests for monetary gain. Vice President Dr. Spesosia Wandira Kasibwe said that these were callously well-orchestrated mass murders perpetrated by a network of diabolic, malevolent criminals masquerading as religious people. The government called for a day of prayer on Sunday, April 2nd to console surviving relatives and assure the country that action is being taken in pursuit of the criminal perpetrators. Police continued to hunt for Joseph Kibuteri, and then it would emerge that he had recently been attending a psychiatric hospital in the capital, been diagnosed as manic depressive, but abandoned his treatment the year before. Not surprised. Hospital senior psychiatrist said Joseph Kibuteri displayed the classic symptoms of the uh, illness, though we don't know what Joseph's exact symptoms were. The typical symptoms of bipolar disorder, sometimes called manic depression, include mania, period of abnormally elevated or irritable mood, as well as extreme changes in emotions, thoughts, energy, talkativeness, and activity level. Mania uh, sometimes comes with delusions and hallucinations. Again, we don't know if Joseph had manic episodes, but according to some research, anywhere from 50 to 75% of people living with bipolar disorder will experience symptoms of psychosis during some mood episodes. But Joseph's condition and attempts at treatment were unknown to the authorities who licensed the cult and to the hundreds of his followers found dead in Kanunga. His mental illness did not excuse his actions in one of his son's eyes. Joseph's son, Juvenar Rogambwa, would say, I feel pity for those people who died. In fact, I hate my father. If he has escaped and I meet him, I wouldn't hesitate killing him. Year after the tragedies, families would still, of course, be suffering the losses of their loved ones. An article wrote on March 16th, 2001, said the cult's compound sat still, unabandoned, or abandoned, excuse me, that the rustling tire rim that served as a bell to summon the faithful now swung from the branch of an avocado tree. A tangle of young saplings pushed up from a mass grave. The compound stone houses were still strewn with torn clothing, half-used tubes of toothpaste, jars of face cream, and bits of candles. No one had decided what to do with the compound yet. A ghostly silence hung over the burned-out hall and the tidy, solid houses where the movement uh, prayed and sang. Locals believed, according to the article, that the place was now haunted. 18-year-old Diaz Tawangere, whose aunt and four cousins perished in the inferno, told a reporter, As dusk approaches, we see figures of people moving up and down as they used to before they were killed in the fire. They put on the same red and blue uniforms. That's fucking spooky. Fodder for a scared to death episode. Said uh, Peter Mogade, nearby farmer, even during the day, I fear that place. We hear the ghosts wailing at night and we see them moving. I know of a whole family of parents, children and grandchildren who had converted to the faith and died on March 17th. My God. People still guarding the site. Uh, officially, the investigation continues at this point, probing into how and why this could have happened. But the leaders, no one knows where they are. Still at large, if alive, no one has a clue where to find them. The internal affairs minister at the time, General Moses Ali, appointed a commission of eminent Ugandans to investigate the cult. But without any money, offices, or facilities to do the job, the commission never actually even met up, ever. You know, again, there's just fucking so much 
confusion of the government and just uh, incompetence and you know money being squandered and stolen. Unlikely that the leaders, if they are free, will ever be caught. The police uh, had no access to computer databases that might link them to neighboring countries uh, where at least one suspect supposedly was seen. Uh, they even lacked gasoline for their new vehicles. Right? This is how fucked up things are. Uh, the investigations are not easy and we were not successful, said the national police spokesman, Asuman Mugini. He said Kata, Katari Babo was last seen in Ro- Rwanda uh, uh, after the fires at a camp of a different cult, then in the Kenyan capital of Nairobi. Also said the Credonia Mwende, seen long after the fire in a village in southwestern Uganda. No one had seen Kibuteri. Many believe he probably did perish in the fire. Answers to why and how this all happened uh, have never come, probably will never come, right? Owing partially to, yeah, Uganda's continued instability. Now that the tragedy is over 20 years in the past, there are still no clues to where the former leaders might be. If any are still alive, uh, you know, likely we're just not going to know much more about all this than what I've already shared. Just another reminder to stay far, far away from anyone who claims to know when the world's ending and uh, how to save you if you stick with them during the final days. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. What a strange and sad story. Before I recap a bit, share a few final thoughts. I do have another sponsor uh, just real fast here. Uh, We've had them on before a few weeks ago. Uh, Excited to uh, see that they, you know, that they did buy another ad. Do black lords thwart you at every turn? Soaring in from spiritual realms and stealing your power. Poisoning your chi, tainting your chakras, dulling your power crystals. Fear not, New Age warrior. Behold the soul power of Terry Hoffman's astral projection online spiritual karate class. Over just eight one-hour online courses delivered over four weeks for only $6,500. You will learn how to turn cocktail swizzle sticks into wizard swords, how to turn car antenna into sorcerer rods, how to convert old dish rags into magic circles, and also now, for only an extra $3,500, Get an additional four hours of classes devoted solely to apocalyptic protection spells. Prepare for the inevitable battle as forces of evil bring human hunting chimeras, baby eating mommy cannibals, weird looking animals, satanic poison pets, seven new diseases, too much rain, and like a lot of workplace misunderstandings and too many people wanting raises and stuff to bring about the apocalypse. You need to do more than ascend your spirit to higher planes and memorize the Akashic Records. You need to do more than carry humanity into the age of Aquarius all by yourself. You can't only focus on astral plane, Black Lord naughty guys. You must save humanity, but also save yourself from hurricanes of fire and also snow. And you can only do that by signing up for Terry Hoffman's Astral Protection Online Spiritual Karate Class and apocalyptic protection spells today. Good luck. So that's cool. You know, glad to see another uh, solid sponsor return. Anyway, the cult of the movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God, what a fucking mess. This whole mess began when Credonia and Joseph met in 1989. She told him that he had been anointed to, uh, to help them spread the word of God, that the Virgin Mary had led them to him. Roman Catholic man known among many in Uganda for his piety, piety, prayer, Good works, uh, but they wouldn't do any good works. Quite the opposite. Did they from the very start intentionally mislead people? Did Creonia manipulate Joseph, uh, get him to back her false claims of her visions? Did she Did she really think she had him? So many questions. Predicting that the world would end with 1999 or end in 1999 after a few misfires, the cult crusaded for a return to a life according to the Ten Commandments, saying that they were the only path to salvation as they interpreted them. Right? Uh, you know, they made a lot, a lot of insane predictions about what would happen to the world in the end times, you know, people are eaten by beasts, food turns poisonous, it's fucking too much rain in Japan, a lot of ca- cannibalism, dogs trying to murder owners because they're poisonous instruments of Satan now. They, they really went hog wild with their prediction writings. They even outlined what countries specifically would face the, you know, uh, what kind of hardships or which ones would avoid them like Mexico. And they wrote about what kind of utopia the faithful would inherit after the apocalypse. Of course, none of that would come to pass because it's, a fucking fever dream at, at, at best and at worst intentional fraud written to help steal from thousands and destroy their lives. 
this nonsense, got them followers, thousands of followers, most notably, uh, uh, you know, people struggling from decades of instability, uh, poverty and illness, People who sold their things, gave money to work on the movement's land, uh, you know, keeping their strong code of behaviors, enduring Cretonia's daily. What in the actual fuck is she talking about, Rance? As more and more followers came to live on the family's farm, tensions grew between, you know, 200 or so early followers, maybe 250 or so, and Joseph's family. The movement finally kicked off his family's land in 1992, but that wouldn't stop them. Settling now on a magnificent plot of fertile hillside, the cult, you know, the Credonia, maybe got by fucking killing siblings uh, and then inheriting from her father. The cult now sets about spreading this message, chiefly through a 163 page manifesto, a timely message from heaven, the end of the present times. The group increases with estimates of members being, uh, you know, around 5,000 at its peak. Exactly what happened when the world did not end, December 31st, 1999, is not clear. What is known is that dozens of followers converged on the Kanunga compound March 16th and 17th, 2000, joining Hunter Darty there. On the morning of the 17th, the flock gathers in the chapel, starts praying. One man leaves to grab some fucking cake for crying kids, comes back astonished to see the church with boarded up windows and locked doors exploding and being consumed in a fiery blaze. When investigators arrive, they find the remains of hundreds of people, mostly their bones, and in some cases, you know, only their ashes uh, heaped at one end of the chapel. Soon more bodies are discovered all over the region, men, women, kids, poisoned, strangled, stabbed, etc., Thought that these were people who wanted their money back when the world didn't end, December of 1999. All in all, nearly 800 people would die or rather be murdered by the leaders of this cult. Leaders who have never been found. Did they die in the fire? Did they die somewhere else? Are they still out there somewhere living off the money they made from killing hundreds of innocent people after taking all their shit and fucking torturing the final days of their lives? Questions about the importance of religious freedom in a country where many cults have flourished, about the competence of the government's security and intelligence network, about uh, Mr. Kibuteri's mysterious movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God, and of course about the leaders of the group, especially Cordonia, follow in Uganda after the tragic end of this cult. What a terrible way to live your final days in fear of an apocalypse. What a terrible way to die, poisoned, burned by the people who were supposed to help you get to heaven, instead made your life a living hell. Beware of false prophets, meat sacks. There's a lot of them out there. Not all of them are as bad shit crazy as Credonia. And it's easy for some of us to spot. Let's look back at this cult once more this week. I also learned something new. And our top five takeaways that are really a top four takeaways every week. With new info added at the end. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, the movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God was an apocalyptic Catholic cult that came out of a particularly tumultuous time for Uganda, a time after the devastating tyrannical rule of General Amin, economic and political instability, the erosion of faith in churches, the AIDS pandemic, epidemic, when Joseph and Cordonia started claiming to see visions of the Virgin Mary and said that she predicted the end times was near those who were looking for something to believe in. People would face so much horror already in their lives. Well, some of them flocked to the group. This had been happening all around Africa as tensions and violence rose, including in nearby Rwanda. But Joseph and Credonia took it further than most of their contemporaries, claiming that Credonia regularly could channel the Virgin Mary's messages through everyday objects via her invisible telephone system. And now this all serves as a good lesson about how instability can really get to us as meat sacks. We all need to stop believing in people who tell us they have a magical cure. Life rarely works out that way. Of course, there are always going to be those who take advantage of people who really have no better options, people with sickly uh, family members, uh, no money to, to help them, who want desperately to believe in something that will get them out of their bad situations. In these cases, it's up to the more fortunate to be vigilant. Look out for these signs. Try to keep our family members, loved ones, fellow meat sacks away from these nasty motherfuckers. Hail Nimrod. Number two. Cult members were forced to give up their money and property to the group's leaders, farm for the group, abstain from sex. Don't talk uh, much about, uh, uh, I, I didn't talk much about that because no extra details were given. Members also forbidden to wash with soap or even to communicate uh, verbally, had to communicate in sign language sometimes to avoid talking and possibly bearing false witness. Even though that's, even though the sign language is a way of talking, that makes no sense. Members were forced to uh, nearly memorize the group's crazy texts, especially that timely message from heaven. <laughs> Spend hours of uh, everyday praying and worshiping. Keep an eye on that precipitation, Japan. Might be a sign of the apocalypse. Now, at number three, on March 17th, 2000, nearly 800 members of the movement, uh, you know, perish in a blazing fire set uh, to their church. Well, sorry, I, I misspoke with that one. There was uh, around 500 and others in other, uh, you know, catastrophic events. These people have been led to believe that the apocalypse would take place on uh, March 17th after it didn't play, take place on December 31st. 
a date many worldwide believed was uh, Y2K, the collapse of society. You know, a lot of these people have been around for two previous mistaken apocalyptic times. In preparation for the final apocalypse, they feasted, drank, worshipped, then were poisoned and burned alive. Number four, Ugandan law enforcement not equipped to deal with this cult. What people call police law enforcement simply categorized the uh, movement as an NGO, a nonprofit, didn't investigate further. That was something I did not mention that did happen a few times. You know, people did report it, but it wasn't taken seriously. And finding justice for the victims has been hampered by a lack of resources and directives, uh, you know, to the police from the government. There's simply just not a lot they can do with a limited but budget, you know, poor political management. Uh, the leaders may still be at large. Number five, new info. Let's learn something nice about Uganda. For example, did you know that in Uganda, you don't wear a Rolex? Well, you can, but more commonly, you eat a Rolex. A uh, Rolex is a type of fast food where an omelet is wrapped in a uh, chapati. Uh, it's, uh, you know, rolled eggs, Rolex. Uh, Ugandans love it so much, they have created an annual Rolex festival that is meant to celebrate this street food. I watched some videos. It looks fucking delicious. So good. And just like so easy to like eat as you walk around. I love handheld food. Uh, so many different kinds. Rolexes with different meats, uh, spices, vegetables, sauces. You know, you can get it for next to nothing from street food vendors all around the country. A uh, country also known as a paradise for bird watching. Not my thing, but I know a lot of people love it. More than 1,000 bird species recorded in Uganda. The African jacana, orange weaver, uh, amongst the most common. Also giraffes, elephants, antelopes, buffaloes, hippopotamuses, crocodiles. Uh, the Bwindi Impenetrable National Park, popular for mountain gorilla population, it's chimpanzees. So don't be scared off by me, only focus on the worst of what Uganda, uh, Uganda has been through. Uh, take precautions when you travel there. You know, know where you're going. You should do that wherever you travel. Uh, but also, you can have a wonderful time there. Check out some travel videos, a bunch of them on YouTube. Nation's gorgeous. Uh, the Bwindi Impenetrable National Park is very green and lush. Lake Victoria, also very picturesque. Uh, the country's crater lakes, also incredible looking. You can go island hopping on Victoria Lake. You can eat a fuck ton of Rolexes. Talk to a lot of good people and have a great time. And not even fucking perish in a doomsday cult. Time suck. Top five takeaways. The movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God cult has been sucked. I hope you found that. If you found that half as interesting as I did, I like that we got to learn about a different place. Then it was uh, an enjoyable episode. Uh, thanks as always to the queen of bad magic, Lindsay Cummins. Thanks to Tyler, the suck ranger directing and producing today. And, uh, Logan, the art warlock for helping him. <laughs> I wrote a nut, my notes. I just don't want to ever forget this stuff. I wrote thanks to, um, Logan comma Tyler. Cause I didn't know when I was writing notes, who was going to be directing and producing. <laughs> and then I, and then I put in parentheses and thanks to the other one for helping him. So whoever the other one was going to be. As if I, as if I wouldn't, as if I'm so fucking note dependent that I would panic if I knew that Tyler was directing and then I was like, oh God, who's the other, What? Who, who's doing other things? Uh, thing else, also, thanks also to Bitelixer for upkeep on the Time Suck app, the Art Warlock, Logan Keith, creating the merch at badmagicmerch.com. So much good stuff. Helping run socials, uh, now along with the Suck Ranger and a team managed by our social media strategist, Ryan Handelsman. Thanks to producer Sophie Evans, again with the initial research this week. She had a really deep, deep dive. Not a lot of source out there and a lot of sources are bad. The information's all over the place. So many different names, uh, dates. Uh, it was a little trickier than normal. Also, thanks to the All Seeing Eyes moderating the Cult of the Cures private Facebook page, Mod Squad on Discord. Uh, met uh, met met Becky uh, at Discord for the second time in uh, Nashville, and she she's great. I'm gonna see her in Louisville too. Uh, thanks to everyone over at the Time Suck subreddit and Bad Magic subreddit. Such a such a great team overall. Uh, next week, the Space Lizards. Uh, let me get them. Have decreed. Actually, no, that's not the music I want. Let me start over. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> the space lizards have decreed that we go full evil to kick off October and suck on a company given the dubious honor of the most evil company in the world. Bear, like the aspirin people. How did they get that label? Might surprise a lot of people that the manufacturer of aspirin, about as uh, mild as the painkillers you can get for treating fevers and headaches, has been involved in some shady shit over the years. First beginning as a dye manufacturer in 1863. <laughs> I said two numbers there, 1863. Uh, Bayer quickly expanded into the realm of chemicals and pharmaceuticals, even uh, synthesizing heroin in the early 20th century, which they then marketed to families and kids as a cough suppressant. Not great, but a lot of people did shit like that where they didn't really understand how bad heroin was back then. But that was uh, far from the end of Bayer's controversies. During World War II, Bayer became part of a conglomerate of businesses, uh, businesses supporting the Nazi party. Not good. And the German war effort. 
and then profiting off of the Nazis' atrocities by experimenting on people in concentration camps. Some people were given vaccines for diseases they already had, vaccines that did little to cure them, others deliberately infected with diseases beforehand, hundreds died, heinous shit. After the war, Bayer rebuilt, rebranded itself during the German economic wonder, the economic boom that German manufacturing experienced in the 50s and 60s. Controversies kept following it. In the 1980s, medicine and manufacturer for hemophilia infected people with HIV, and there was evidence that Bayer knew about this contaminated medicine long before they did anything about it. They would also be responsible for poisoning Peruvian children in the late 90s, selling birth control that caused its users serious medical problems, and much more. But it would be uh, 2018 that would see Bayer's newest incarnation when the company bought Monsanto, a bioengineering company that many have also called the most evil company in the world. Some critics have called this pairing a match. A match made in hell itself. How is Bayer so evil? How evil is Monsanto? Are they really that bad when I talk in this voice again? How has the drive for profits made these companies engage in less than ethical behavior? How have the people exploited by these companies tried to fight back? All this and more next week on Time Suck. Now let's head to this week's Time Sucker Updates. When I push uh, this uh, button here. Updates. Get your Time Sucker Updates. Starting with the Ronnie Joe update. His fragile fucking butthole. Uh, that episode came out uh, just two days ago. As I record this, Marvelous Meat Sack Bill, I'll leave his last name out of this, is a cult survivor who may have also been a serial killer survivor. Bill writes, I may have had an encounter with Ronald Dominique. In the late 90s to early 2000s, I was married and my now ex-wife was a stripper. We lived in Florida and in September of 2000, she took off for, a new, for New Orleans to work those clubs to make some quick cash. That was just a cover story, though. I decided to go get her, attempt to work out her issues. Excuse me. I knew I'd need some money, so I bought a banana hammock. I was in good shape then. There was a club on Bourbon Street that is a women's strip club in the front and a dude strip club in the back. I worked there for a night just to get money to keep me going while I was there. Excuse me, man. Sorry. There was a, I drank some water during that little sounder. My stomach went crazy. There was a guy who kept asking me to dance for him. I told him that I wouldn't dance for a man, went to talk to the ladies who were there. So later he comes back up to me. Tells me that his wife would love me and asked what time I got off work. Said he wanted me to go home with his, uh, to go home with him and fuck his wife. He was creeping me out. I told him to get the hell away from me. I had broken my wrist, had a cast in my right hand. Maybe thought I'd be uh, easier to subdue that way. He mentioned it a couple times about admiring me for still dancing with a broken wrist. Never thought about it much after that night, but after hearing your episode, I thought his MO sounded familiar. So I Googled him. His pick looks exactly like the guy I remember talking to. I freaked out. I'm a cold survivor. Now it seems like I'm a serial killer survivor as well. Yeah, I'd say so. I'd heard a couple episodes on Ronnie uh, from other podcasts. None of them went into as much detail as yours did. Never made the connection until listening to your episode. Just thought I'd share that. Love the show. Three out of five stars. Well, holy shit, Bill. Does seem like you almost became one of Ronnie Joe's victims. That's just terrifying. Uh, weird for me to think about seeing your name in a very different context. Had you not, uh, you know, trusted your gut. I would have seen your name in research from a few weeks ago instead of, uh, you know, on a message from a time sucker this week. So very glad you're okay. And hope life is going great for you and stay safe. And now a medical meat sack sends in an update to an update from a few weeks ago. Updating that message in the Catholic uh, sex abuse scandal episode left by the fantastic Carrie Davis talking about a brave and also fantastic and amazing daughter Brandy struggle with acute myeloid leukemia. Dr. Jake uh, Basham writes, Hello, Dan and the Bad Magic crew. Loyal time sucker Jake here. I've written it before. I've even had the unbelievably unique pleasure of having my email read by Dan as a time sucker update. I wanted to write in regarding the time sucker update and one very special sucker, Brandy. For some context, I'm a resident physician scientist in the Children's Hospital at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville. I spend roughly 20% of my time. I was just down the street from you at a hotel this last weekend. I spent roughly 20% of my time providing care to the sick and, and well, I'm sorry, I spend... Roughly 20% of my time providing care to sick and well, gosh, I knew it was correct before, children as a pediatrician, and the other 80% doing basic science research. My scientific area of expertise lies in the field of immunology, uh, specifically T cells, which are the primary component of the adaptive immune system, that part of our immune system that is activated with vaccines and provides immunity to certain illnesses. When someone says, I have immunity to insert uh, sorry, my God, I can, let's say my brain just shut down. When somebody says, quote, I have immunity to 
insert infectious disease here. What they're really saying is my T cells have seen that insert infectious disease here and will reactivate quickly if it's seen again. The body's immune system is what is responsible for the GVHD that Brandy experiences. I have had the humbling experiences of taking care of children with GVHD. So first, I want to say that Brandy's strength is more than most people could even ever imagine. The next thing I want to say is directly to Brandy. I was so touched by her mother's description of how the Bad Magic Camp brought joy to her. My lab is working specifically on understanding why and how, on a detailed molecular level, the donor cells begin attacking the recipient. I won't go into any specific science talk because even my colleagues get glazed eyes when I start talking about it. This area of research has been a focus of mine. For nearly two years now, I'm only 34, so I haven't been doing this terribly long, but I want Brandy to know that at a minimum, there's a time sucker out there trying to use science to conquer this particular complication of a bone marrow transplant. Not virtue signaling here, just hoping that this reaches her and provides some sense of literally anything good to her strong, resilient, and beautiful soul. This community is so important to me, so thank you, Dan, for building this empire of oddities. All the best, Jake. Well, damn it, Jake. Are you an allergy specialist as well? Because uh, you fucked my allergies up the first uh, time I read that message. Actually, the first two times I read the message. Are you part of some government ex- ex- program to try and make men who hate to intentionally feel emotions feel them anyway? Trying to make me soft. Biden put you up to this. Answer me. Seriously, though. Uh, thank you so much for sending that message. Uh, what an awesome thing for Carrie and Brandy to hear. I mean, for everyone to hear. Please keep doing what you're doing. I mean, I tell jokes generally dark stories, share tidbits of knowledge here and there. Uh, People like yourself save lives, sometimes millions of lives with breakthroughs. You save others' pain. You give so many people hope that their pain will end or their children's pain. You're the real miracle workers in life to me, right? Like real hero shit. So keep being the fucking best man. Hail fucking Nimrod. That was intense because I'm a baby who often hides from deep emotion. Let's lighten things up for a second with a Cummins Law message from an embarrassed sack, Levi Swanson, who writes... God damn it, master sucker. I've been a loyal listener from day one, listening religiously as I drive for a living. I'm a food salesman for a regional distributor in the tri-state area of New York, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. I've prided myself on never being duped by any of your deep fakes or being Cummins Law, but son of a bitch, you got me. I was in the packed dining room of a customer's house with my phone in my breast pocket when I must have accidentally hit the play button and loud as could be, while my openly Catholic customer sits across from me, you scream, and deadlin' little kids! (laughs) I frantically fumbled for my phone, turned the entire thing off while distraught old women and grizzled farmers stared at me in disgust. I can only imagine how red my face was, but I sure as hell hope I didn't lose a customer today. Whatever, worth it, three out of five stars wouldn't change a thing. Well, thank you, Levi. I needed that right now. Uh, I wish you had a picture of their faces when that happened. I think you should have them listen to the full episode. I think you should force them to. So they know I'm against kids getting diddled and fucked. Hope you didn't lose a customer. But also, you know what? If they can't handle a little moment like that, fuck them. Uh, next up, known known drug user, Mal Sor- Sorrels, has melted his fucking mind permanently. It'll never be the same, ever. He writes, probably from prison. <laughs> I don't know if this will reach you, but I had to tell you, you finally got me. I've had a lot happen the last few months. It sent me into a deep enough depression that I couldn't take joy in anything anymore, including the suck and stand up, which had gotten me through several rough patches in the past. Once I started feeling better, I decided to take some special mushrooms. Sweet. Catch up on the episodes I've missed, starting with Dee Dee's story. <laughs> Somehow, in my personal hiatus from the show, I forgot how much you like to mislead us on tangents that do not exist. And you can only imagine where my already altered mind went when you started going on about the cause of Munchausen syndrome. I actually paused the show. Yeah, that's when I started acting like I was talking directly to whoever listening that drugs have given them this. I actually paused the show, went on a deep dive rabbit hole, looking up the condition, high as fuck, wondered if maybe the injury I have that's put me out of work for two months was all in my head. And maybe I was making it up for clout or something, even though I was hurt, I was hurting the entire time. You really had me contemplating the power of the mind over the body and how maybe all the substances I've taken really have gotten to my head. I'm glad I only spent about 45 minutes in this hole. <laughs> before unpausing and getting to the inevitable end of the roots. After being a fan for so long, I can't believe you actually got me that bad, but it couldn't have come at a better time. I laughed my ass off. Reminded me exactly why I tend to turn to you and the show for comfort and a sense of belonging. I've recommended the show to so many people uh, and they shy away at the timestamp, but honestly, I wish they were longer. I feel like I've come back home after a long trip to hell and I wouldn't change a thing. This warmth is hard to find and you provide it just by being you. Thanks for everything you do for us, Meat Sacks. It does not go underappreciated. 
Oh man. Uh, well, thank you for the words. Uh, also, uh, we had a really good laugh. Logan and I, but about the wormhole he went into here in the stuck dungeon. Uh, I laughed so hard. Just imagine you just going, Oh fuck. Oh no, no. Oh, what have I done? Glad you got the laugh you needed. Uh, and that you're back. Very glad. Um, yeah. And, uh, you returned the favor, uh, really made us laugh. And now let's end on some inspiration from a beautiful sucker with the best perspective who gives us a very different kind of Bayou Strangler update writing. And this is Irish from discord. Good morning, afternoon, night, whatever other time it might be when you read this, dear suck master. I've written it a few times, but something in the Bayou Strangler episode told me I should write it again. This might be a long one, but I think you'll be able to make it through. In the episode, you give us some stats about poverty, the money you have to make to be above that line. As a father of six, I was thinking, wonder what it is for a family of eight. And sure as shit, you gave the number, 44,000 and some change. I can say that despite all my efforts so far, we are below that line. My wife is a stay-at-home mom. (laughs) Well, yeah, I mean, fucking six kids. Uh, I work 80 hours a week to pay for everything and make sure my kids want for nothing. Yeah, they may not get that sweet Fortnite skin when it comes out, but they mostly get everything they ask for. I'm not writing in to give a woe is me tale. I just want every one of these kind of situations to know that everything will be okay. Keep pushing. Keep working your ass off. Things will get better. You can climb out of that hole. It may take time, but you can do it. Keeping the beautiful meat sack, I know you are. I thought this was going to be longer, but I may have misjudged my ability with the written word. Who knows? Maybe I just don't have a lot to say. Either way, sorry, not sorry for the length. Thanks as always for the wonderful content you always put out. It always helps me get through the long work days. Three out of five stars. Wouldn't change a thing. If you end up reading this on the podcast, please feel free to leave my name out. Just refer to me as Irish from Discord. P.S. I'm attaching some photos of the fam just so you can see that even though we are struggling, life can still be wonderful. Well, thank you, Irish from Discord. And yes, I watched, I looked at the pics and you have a beautiful family and you all seem very, very happy. So good on you. And man, damn, thank you for the perspective. I, I could only imagine how many people listening need to hear that, right? You might have just turned around the day, week, month, year fucking life for dozens or, or, or hundreds right more even just one person is beyond worth it keep being an awesome provider a, a fucking machine who will stop at nothing to put food on the table for your family a great husband great dad in a world that always has a great dad shortage thanks everyone for the best messages week in and week out you guys are the fucking best lucky to hear from you truly very lucky thanks time suckers I needed that. We all did. Another Bad Magic Productions podcast is the finished. Finito. Uh, don't, 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 don't join a cult this week. Uh, other than this one, I promise to never burn any of you alive in a church on a, on a day I predicted the world will end. I do promise to keep on sucking. <laughs> Bad Magic Productions. Are you ready for the apocalypse, the final showdown? In the days before the world ends, there will be the worst atrocities the world has ever seen. Avalanches of lava, plagues of locusts the size of trucks with heads of dragons that breathe fire. Herpes cold sores that can fly from one person's lips to another's or genitals and rot off your dick or puss. Bats made out of human shit that climb into your mouth. Spiders the size of pit bulls that have razors for paws. Demons that skin you but leave you alive and also not done. Hangnails. Some mental fogginess. Maybe allergies, but probably not. Sitting in traffic that causes you to almost be late. Even when you left early and now you're in a bad mood, when you could have been in, uh, woke up in a pretty good mood. And a little bit of gas, not enough to always even fart. You might want to fart, but you can't. And that is even worse than more gas, if you know what I'm saying, because then people don't have as much sympathy for you, but they maybe should have. That's the devil doing that to you. Raining fire. Making it so you really wanted that last maple bar that you got and put above the microwave, but then someone took it at the last second. <laughs> <clears throat> and that kind of stuff.